Welcome to the first part of The Yellow Claw by Sax Roma. In this thrilling tale, we follow the enigmatic and sinister adventures of the infamous criminal mastermind, The Yellow Claw. Set in the early 20th century, this gripping story unveils a series of mysterious and dangerous events that will keep you on the edge of your seat. As we dive into the world of espionage, crime and intrigue, Prepare to meet a cast of intriguing characters and face a plot that twists and turns with every page. Enjoy the journey into the shadowy depths of crime and mystery. Chapter 1. The Lady of the Civet Furs Henry LaRue wrote busily on, the light of the table lamp, softened and enriched by its mosaic shade, gave an appearance of added opulence to the already handsome appointments of the room. The little table clock ticked merrily from half-past eleven, to a quarter to twelve. Into the cosy, bookish atmosphere of the novelist's study penetrated the muffled chime of Big Ben, it chimed the three quarters. But, with his mind centred upon his work, LaRue wrote on ceaselessly. An odd figure of a man was this popular novelist, with patchy and untidy hair which lessened the otherwise striking contour of his brow. A neglected and unpicturesque figure, in a baggy, neutral-coloured dressing gown, a figure more fitted to a garret than to this spacious, luxurious workroom. With the soft light playing upon rank after rank of rare and costly additions, deepening the tones in the Persian carpet, making red Morocco more red, purifying the vellum and regilding the gold of the choice bindings. Caressing lovingly the busts and statuettes surmounting the bookshelves and twinkling upon the scantily covered crown of Henry LaRue, the doorbell rang. LaRue, heedless of external matters, pursued his work, but the doorbell rang again and continued to ring. Soames, Soames, LaRue raised his voice irascibly, continuing to write the while. Where the devil are you? Can't you hear the doorbell? Soames did not reveal himself, and to the ringing of the bell was added the unmistakable rattling of a letterbox. Soames, LaRue put down his pen and stood up. Damn it, he's out. I have no memory. He retied the girdle of his dressing gown, which had become unfastened, and opened the study door. Opposite, across the entrance lobby, was the outer door, and in the light from the lobby lamp he perceived two laughing eyes peering in under the upraised flap of the letterbox. The ringing ceased. Are you very angry with me for interrupting you? cried a girl's voice. My dear Miss Cumberly, said LaRue without irritation, on the contrary, I am delighted to see you, or rather to hear you. There is nobody at home, you know. I do know, replied the girl firmly, and I know something else also. Father assures me that you simply starve yourself when Mrs. LaRue is away, so I have brought down an omelette. Omelette, muttered LaRue, advancing toward the door. You have a brought an omelette. I understand, yes, you have brought an omelette. Uh, that is very good of you. He hesitated when about to open the outer door, raising his hands to his disheveled hair and unshaven chin. The flap of the letterbox dropped, and the girl outside could be heard stifling her laughter. You must think me a very rude, began LaRue. I mean not to open the door. But I quite understand, concluded the voice of the unseen one. You are a most untidy object and I shall tell Mira directly she returns that she has no right to leave you alone like this. Now I am going to hurry back upstairs, so you may appear safely. Don't let the omelette get cold. Good night. No, certainly I shall not, cried LaRue. So good of you I do like omelette. Good night. Calmly he returned to his writing table, where, in the pursuit of the elusive character whose exploits he was chronicling, and who had brought him fame and wealth, he forgot in the same moment Helen Cumberly and the omelette. The table clock ticked merrily on. Scratch, scratch, splutter, scratch went Henry LaRue's pen for this up-to-date literateur, essayist by inclination, creator of Martin Zader, criminal scientist by popular clamor, was yet old-fashioned enough and sufficient of an enthusiast to pen his work while lesser men dictated. So... Amidst that classic company smiling or frowning upon him from the oaken shelves, where Petronius Arbiter, exquisite, rubbed shoulders with Balzac. Plebeian, where Omar Khayyam leaned confidentially toward Philostratus, where Mark Twain, 
standing squarely beside Thomas Carlyle, glared across the room at George Meredith. Henry LaRue pursued the amazing career of Martin Zader. It wanted but five minutes to the hour of midnight, when again the doorbell clamoured in the silence. LaRue wrote steadily on. The bell continued to ring, and furthermore, the ringer could be heard beating upon the outer door. Soames, cried LaRue irritably. Soames, why the hell don't you go to the door? LaRue stood up, dashing his pen upon the table. I shall have to sack that damned man, he cried. He takes too many liberties stopping out until this hour of the night. He pulled open the study door, crossed the hallway, and opened the door beyond. In, out of the darkness, for the stair lights had been extinguished, staggered a woman, a woman whose pale face exhibited, despite the ravages of sorrow or illness, signs of quite unusual beauty. Her eyes were wide opened, and terror-stricken, the pupils contracted almost to vanishing point. She wore a magnificent cloak of civet fur wrapped tightly about her, and as LaRue opened the door, she tottered past him into the lobby, glancing back over her shoulder. With his upraised hands plunged pathetically into the mop of his hair, LaRue turned and stared at the intruder. She groped as if a darkness had descended, clutched at the sides of the study doorway, and then, unsteadily, entered and sank down upon the big Chesterfield in utter exhaustion. LaRue, rubbing his chin perplexedly, walked in after her. He scarcely had his foot upon the study carpet, ere the woman started up tremulously and shot out from the enveloping furs a bare arm and a pointing, quivering finger. Close the door, she cried hoarsely. Close the door. He has. Followed Mem. The disturbed novelist, as a man in a dream, turned, retraced his steps, and closed the outer door of the flat. Then, rubbing his chin more vigorously than ever, and only desisting from this exercise to fumble in his dishevelled hair, he walked back into the study, whose Athenian calm had thus mysteriously been violated. Two minutes to midnight, the most respectable flat in respectable Westminster, a lonely and very abstracted novelist, and a pale-faced, beautiful woman enveloped in costly furs, sitting staring with fearful eyes straight before her, this was such a scene as his sense of the proprieties and of the probabilities could never have permitted Henry LaRue to create. His visitor kept moistening her dry lips and swallowing, emotionally. Standing at a discreet distance from her, Madam, began LaRue nervously. She waved her hand, enjoining him to silence, and at the same time intimating that she would explain herself directly speech became possible. Whilst she sought to recover her composure, LaRue, gradually forcing himself out of the dreamlike state, studied her with a sort of anxious curiosity. It now became apparent to him that his visitor was no more than twenty-five or twenty-six years of age, but illness or trouble, or both together, had seared and marred her beauty. Amid the auburn masses of her hair gleamed streaks, not of grey, but of purest white. The low brow was faintly wrinkled and the big unnaturally big eyes were purple-shaded, whilst two heavy lines traced their way from the corner of the nostrils to the corner of the mouth of the drooping mouth with the bloodless lips. Her pallor became more strange and interesting the longer he studied it, for, underlying the skin was a yellow tinge which he found inexplicable, but which he linked in his mind with the contracted pupils of her eyes, seeking vainly for a common cause. He had a hazy impression that his visitor, beneath her furs, was most inadequately clothed, and seeking confirmation of this, his gaze strayed downward to where one little slippered foot peeped out from the civet furs. LaRue suppressed a gasp. He had caught a glimpse of a bare ankle. He crossed to his writing table and seated himself, glancing sideways at this living mystery. Suddenly she began, in a voice tremulous and scarcely audible, Mr. LaRue, at a great, at a very great personal risk, I have come tonight. What I have to ask of you, to entreat of you, Will. Will, bare arms emerged from the fur, and she began clutching at her throat and bosom as though choking, dying. LaRue leapt up and would have run to her, but forcing a ghastly smile, she waved him away again. It is all right, she muttered, swallowing noisily. But frightful spasms of pain convulsed her, contorting her pale face, 
Some brandy, cried LaRue anxiously. If you please, whispered the visitor. She dropped her arms and fell back upon the Chesterfield, insensible. Chapter 2 Midnight and Mr. King LaRue clutched at the corner of the writing table to steady himself and stood there looking at the deathly face. Under the most favorable circumstances, he was no man of action, although in common with the rest of his kind, he prided himself upon the possession of that presence of mind which he lacked. It was a situation which could not have alarmed Martin Zader, but it alarmed immeasurably, nay, struck inert with horror, Martin Zader's creator. Then, in upon LaRue's mental turmoil, a sensible idea intruded itself. Dr. Cumberly, he muttered, I hope to God he is in. Without touching the recumbent form upon the Chesterfield, without seeking to learn, without daring to learn, if she lived or had died, LaRue, the tempo of his life changed to a breathless gallop, rushed out of the study, across the entrance hail, and throwing wide the flat door, leapt up the stair to the flat above that of his old friend Dr. Cumberly. The patter of the slippered feet grew faint upon the stair, then, as LaRue reached the landing above, became inaudible altogether. In LaRue's study, the table clock ticked merrily on, seeming to hasten its ticking as the hand crept around closer and closer to midnight. The mosaic shade of the lamp mingled reds and blues and greens upon the white ceiling above and poured golden light upon the pages of manuscript strewn about beneath it. This was a typical workroom of a literary man having the ear of the public typical in every respect, save for the fur-clad figure outstretched upon the settee, and now the peeping light indiscreetly penetrated to the hem of a silken garment revealed by some disarrangement of the civet fur. To the eye of an experienced observer, had such an observer been present in Henry LaRue's study, this billow of silk and lace behind the sheltering fur must have proclaimed itself the edge of a night robe. Just as the ankle beneath had proclaimed itself to Henry LaRue's shocked susceptibilities to be innocent of stocking. Thirty seconds were wanted to complete the cycle of the day, when one of the listless hands thrown across the back of the Chesterfield opened and closed spasmodically. The fur at the bosom of the midnight visitor began rapidly to rise and fall. Then, with a choking cry, the woman struggled upright. Her hair, hastily dressed, burst free of its bindings and poured in gleaming cascade down about her shoulders. Clutching with one hand at her cloak in order to keep it wrapped about her and holding the other blindly before her, she rose and with that same odd groping movement began to approach the writing table. The pupils of her eyes were mere pinpoints now. She shuddered convulsively, and her skin was dewed with perspiration. Her breath came in agonized gasps. God, I am dying, and I cannot tell him, she breathed. Feverishly, weakly, she took up a pen, and upon a quarto page, already half filled with LaRue's small, neat, illegible writing, began to scrawl a message, bending down, one hand upon the table, and with her whole body shaking. Some three or four wavering lines she had written, when intimately, for the flat of Henry LaRue in Palace Mansions lay within sight of the clock face, Big Ben began to chime midnight. The writer started back and dropped a great blot of ink upon the paper, then, realizing the cause of the disturbance, forced herself to continue her task. The chime being completed, one, boomed the clock, two, three, four, the light in the entrance hall went out. Five, boomed Big Ben. Six, seven, a hand of old ivory hue, a long yellow clawish hand with part of a sinewy forearm crept in from the black lobby through the study doorway and touched the electric switch. Eight, the study was plunged in darkness. Uttering a sob, a cry of agony and horror that came from her very soul, the woman stood upright and turned to face toward the door, clutching the sheet of paper in one rigid hand. Through the leaded panes of the window above the writing table swept a silvern beam of moonlight. It poured, searchingly, upon the fur-clad figure swaying by the table, cutting through the darkness of the room like some huge scimitar, to end in a pallid pool about the woman's shadow on the center of the Persian carpet. Coincident with her sobbing cry nine, boomed Big Ben, ten, 
Two hands with outstretched, crooked, clutching fingers leapt from the darkness into the light of the moonbeam. God! Oh, God! came a frenzied, rasping shriek, Mr. King! Straight at the bare throat leapt the yellow hands. A gurgling cry rose fell and died away. Gently, noiselessly, the lady of the civet fur sank upon the carpet by the table. As she fell, a dim black figure bent over her. The tearing of paper told of the note being snatched from her frozen grip, but never for a moment did the face or the form of her assailant encroach upon the moonbeam. Bat-like, this second and terrible visitant avoided the light. The deed had occupied so brief a time that but one note of the great bell had accompanied it. Twelve! rang out the final stroke from the clock tower, a low, eerie whistle minor, rising in three irregular notes and falling in weird, unusual cadence to silence again, came from somewhere outside the room. Then darkness stillness with the moon, a witness of one more ghastly crime. Presently, confused and intermingled voices from above proclaimed the return of LaRue with the doctor. They were talking in an excited key, the voice of LaRue especially, sounding almost hysterical. They created such a disturbance that they attracted the attention of Mr. John Exel, M.P., occupant of the flat below, who at that very moment had returned from the house and was about to insert the key in the lock of his door. He looked up the stairway, but all being in darkness, was unable to detect anything. Therefore he called out, Is that you, LaRue? Is anything the matter? Matter, Exel, cried LaRue. There's a devil of a business. For mercy's sake, come up. His curiosity greatly excited, Mr. Exel mounted the stairs, entering the lobby of LaRue's flat immediately behind the owner, and Dr. Cumberley, who, like LaRue, was arrayed in a dressing gown, for he had been in bed when summoned by his friend. You are all in the dark here, muttered Dr. Cumberley, fumbling for the switch. Someone has turned the light out, whispered LaRue nervously. I left it on. Dr. Cumberley pressed the switch, turning up the lobby light as Exel entered from the landing. Then LaRue, entering the study first of the three, switched on the light there also. One glance he threw about the room, then started back like a man physically stricken. Cumberly, he gasped. Cumberly, and he pointed to the furry heap by the writing table. You said she lay on the Chesterfield, muttered Cumberly. I left her there. Dr. Cumberly crossed the room and dropped upon his knees. He turned the white face toward the light, gently parted the civet fur, and pressed his ear to the silken covering of the breast. He started slightly and looked into the glazing eyes. Replacing the fur which he had disarranged, the physician stood up and fixed a keen gaze upon the face of Henry LaRue. The latter swallowed noisily, moistening his parched lips. Is she, he muttered, is she God's mercy, LaRue, whispered Mr. Exel. What does this mean? The woman is dead, said Dr. Cumberley. In common with all medical men, Dr. Cumberley was a physiognomist. He was a great physician and a proportionately great physiognomist. Therefore, when he looked into Henry LaRue's eyes, he saw there, and recognized horror and consternation. With no further evidence than that furnished by his own powers of perception, he knew that the mystery of this woman's death was as inexplicable to Henry LaRue as it was inexplicable to himself. He was a masterful man, with the grey eyes of a diplomat, and he knew LaRue as did few men. He laid both hands upon the novelist's shoulders. Brace up, old chap, he said. You will want all your wits about you. I left her, began LaRue hesitatingly. I left. We know all about where you left her, LaRue, interrupted Cumberly. But what we want to get at is this. What occurred between the time you left her and the time of our return? Exel, who had walked across to the table and with a horror-stricken face was gingerly examining the victim, now exclaimed, Why? LaRue, she is, she is undressed. LaRue clutched at his disheveled hair with both hands. My dear Exel, he cried, my dear good man, why do you use that tone? You say she is undressed as though I were responsible for the poor soul's condition. On the contrary, LaRue, retorted Exel, standing very upright and staring through his monocle. On the contrary, you misconstrue me. I did not intend to imply, to insinuate. My dear Exel broke in Dr. Cumberley. 
LaRue is perfectly well aware that you intended nothing unkindly, but the poor chap, quite naturally, is distraught at the moment. You must understand that, man. I understand, and I am sorry, said Axel, casting a sidelong glance at the body. Of course, it is a delicate subject. No doubt LaRue can explain. Damn your explanation, shrieked LaRue hysterically. I cannot explain. If I could explain, I LaRue, said Cumberly, placing his arm paternally about the shaking man. You are such a nervous subject. Do make an effort, old fellow. Pull yourself together. Axel does not know the circumstances. I am curious to learn them, said the MP icily. LaRue was about to launch some angry retort, but Cumberly forced him into the Chesterfield, and crossing to a bureau, poured out a stiff peg of brandy from a decanter which stood there. LaRue sank upon the Chesterfield, rubbing his fingers up and down his palms with a curious nervous movement, and glancing at the dead woman, and at Exel, alternately, in a mechanical regular fashion, pathetic to behold. Mr. Exel, tapping his boot with the head of his inverted cane, was staring fixedly at the doctor. "'Here you are, LaRue,' said Cumberly. "'Drink this up and let us arrange our facts in decent order before we... "'Phone for the police,' concluded Axel, his gaze upon the last speaker. LaRue drank the brandy at a gulp and put down the glass upon a little Persian coffee table, with a hand which he had somehow contrived to steady. "'You are keen on the official forms, Axel," he said with a wry smile, Please accept my apology for my recent outburst, but picture this thing happening in your place. I cannot, declared Axel bluntly. You lack imagination, said Cumberly. Take a whiskey and soda, and help me to search the flat. Search the flat, the physician raised a forefinger forensically. Since you, Axel, if not actually in the building, must certainly have been within sight of the street entrance at the moment of the crime, and since LaRue and I descended the stair and met you on the landing... It is reasonable to suppose that the assassin can only be in one place. Here. Here, cried Axel and LaRue together. Did you see anyone leave the lower hall as you entered? No one, emphatically. There was no one there. Then I am right. Good God, whispered Axel, glancing about him with a new and keen apprehensiveness. Take your drink, concluded Cumberly, and join me in my search. Thanks replied Axel, nervously proffering a cigar case, but I won't drink. As you wish, said the doctor, who thus in his masterful way acted the host, and I won't smoke, but do you light up? Later, muttered Axel, later, let us search first. LaRue stood up, cumberly forced him back. Stay where you are, LaRue, it is elementary strategy to operate from a fixed base. This study shall be the base. Ready, Axel? Axel nodded, and the search commenced. LaRue sat rigidly upon the settee, his hands resting upon his knees, watching and listening. Save for the merry ticking of the table clock and the movements of the searchers from room to room, nothing disturbed the silence. From the table, and that which lay near to it, he kept his gaze obstinately averted. Five or six minutes passed in this fashion, LaRue expecting each to bring a sudden outcry. He was disappointed. The searchers returned, Axel noticeably holding himself aloof and Cumberly very stern. Axel, a cigar between his teeth, walked to the writing table, carefully circling around the dreadful obstacle which lay in his path, to help himself to a match. As he stooped to do so, he perceived that in the closed right hand of the dead woman was a torn scrap of paper. LaRue! Cumberly! he exclaimed. Come here, he pointed with a match as Cumberly hurriedly crossed to his side. LaRue, inert, remained where he sat, but watched with haggard eyes. Dr. Cumberly bent down and sought to detach the paper from the grip of the poor cold fingers without tearing it. Finally he contrived to release the fragment, and perceiving it to bear some written words, he spread it out beneath the lamp on the table and eagerly scanned it lowering his massive grey head close to the writing. He inhaled sibilantly. Do you see, Axel? He jerked, for Axel was bending over his shoulder. I do, but I don't understand. What is it? Came hollowly from LaRue. It is the bottom part of an unfinished note, said Cumberly slowly. It is written shakily in a woman's hand, and it reads your wife. 
Larue sprang to his feet and crossed the room in three strides. Wife, he muttered. His voice seemed to be choked in his throat. My wife. It says something about my wife. It says, resumed the doctor quietly, your wife. Then there's a piece torn out, and the two words, Mr. King. No stop follows, and the line is evidently incomplete. My wife, mumbled Larue, staring unseeingly at the fragment of paper. My wife, Mr. King. Oh, God, I shall go mad. Sit down, snapped Dr. Cumberly, turning to him. Damn it, Larue, you are worse than a woman. In a manner almost childlike, the novelist obeyed the will of the stronger man, throwing himself into an armchair and burying his face in his hands. My wife, he kept muttering, my wife. Exel and the doctor stood staring at one another, when suddenly from outside the flat came a metallic clattering, followed by a little suppressed cry. Helen Cumberly, in daintiest deshabille, appeared in the lobby, carrying, in one hand, a chafing dish, and, in the other, the lid. As she advanced toward the study from whence she had heard her father's voice, Why, Mr. LaRue, she cried, I shall certainly report you to Mira now. You have not even touched the omelette. Good God! Cumberly, stop her, muttered Axel uneasily. The door was not latched, but it was too late. Even as the physician turned to intercept his daughter, she crossed the threshold of the study. She stopped short at perceiving Exel, then, with a woman's unerring intuition, divined a tragedy, and in the instant of divination, sought for and found the hub of the tragic wheel. One swift glance she cast at the fur-clad form, prostrate. The chafing dish fell from her hand, and the omelette rolled, a grotesque mass, upon the carpet. She swayed, dizzily, raising one hand to her brow, but had recovered herself even as LaRue sprang forward to support her. All right, LaRue, cried Cumberly. I will take her upstairs again. Wait for me, Axel. Axel nodded, lighted his cigar, and sat down in a chair, remote from the writing table. Mira, my wife, muttered LaRue, standing, looking after Dr. Cumberly and his daughter as they crossed the lobby. She will report to my wife. In the outer doorway, Helen Cumberly looked back over her shoulder, and her glance met that of LaRue. Hers was a healing glance and a strengthening glance. It braced him up as nothing else could have done. He turned to Axel. For heaven's sake, Axel, he said evenly, give me your advice, give me your help. I am going to phone for the police. Axel looked up with an odd expression. I am entirely at your service, LaRue, he said. I can quite understand how this ghastly affair has shaken you up. It was so sudden, said the other plaintively. It is incredible that so much emotion can be crowded into so short a period of a man's life. Big Ben chimed the quarter after midnight. LaRue, eyes averted, walked to the writing table and took up the telephone. Chapter 3. Inspector Dunbar Takes Charge Detective Inspector Dunbar was admitted by Dr. Cumberley. He was a man of notable height, large-boned, and built gauntly and squarely. His clothes fitted him ill, and through them one seemed to perceive the massive scaffolding of his frame. He had grey hair retiring above a high brow, but worn long and untidily at the back, a wire-like straight-cut moustache, also streaked with grey, which served to accentuate the grimness of his mouth and slightly undershot jaw. A massive head, with tawny, leonine eyes, indeed altogether a leonine face, and a frame indicative of tremendous nervous energy. In the entrance lobby he stood for a moment. "'My name is Cumberley,' said the doctor, glancing at the card which the Scotland Yard man had proffered. "'I occupy the flat above.' "'Glad to know you, Dr. Cumberley,' replied the detective in a light and not unpleasant voice, and the fierce eyes momentarily grew kindly. "'This,' continued Cumberley, drawing Dunbar forward into the study, "'is my friend, Larue Henry Larue, whose name you will know.' I have not that pleasure, replied Dunbar. Well, added Cumberley, he is a famous novelist, and his flat, unfortunately, has been made the scene of a crime. This is Detective Inspector Dunbar, who has come to solve our difficulties, LaRue. He turned to where Axel stood upon the hearth rug toying with his monocle. Mr. John Axel, MP. Glad to know you, gentlemen, said Dunbar. 
Larue rose from the armchair in which he had been sitting and stared drearily at the newcomer. Exel screwed the monocle into his right eye and likewise surveyed the detective. Cumberly, taking a tumbler from the bureau, said, A scotch and soda, Inspector. It is a suggestion, said Dunbar, that coming from a medical man appeals. Whilst the doctor poured out the whiskey and squirted the soda into the glass, Inspector Dunbar, standing squarely in the middle of the room, fixed his eyes upon the still form lying in the shadow of the writing table. You will have been called in, doctor, he said, taking the proffered tumbler, at the time of the crime. Exactly, replied Cumberly. Mr. LaRue ran up to my flat and summoned me to see the woman. What time would that be? Big Ben had just struck the final stroke of twelve when I came out onto the landing. Mr. LaRue would be waiting there for you. He stood in my entrance lobby whilst I slipped on my dressing gown, and we came down together. I was entering from the street, interrupted Axel, as they were descending from above. You can enter from the street, sir, in a moment, said Dunbar, holding up his hand. One witness at a time, if you please. Axel shrugged his shoulders and turned slightly, leaning his elbow upon the mantelpiece and flicking off the ash from his cigar. I take it you were in bed, questioned Dunbar turning again to the doctor. I had been in bed about a quarter of an hour when I was aroused by the ringing of the doorbell. This ringing struck me as so urgent that I ran out in my pyjamas and found there Mr. LaRue in a very disturbed state. What did he say? Give his own words as nearly as you remember them. LaRue, who had been standing, sank slowly back into the armchair with his eyes upon Dr. Cumberly as the latter replied, He said, Cumberly, Cumberly, for God's sake, come down at once. There is a strange woman in my flat, apparently in a dying condition. What did you do? I ran into my bedroom and slipped on my dressing gown, leaving Mr. LaRue in the entrance hall. Then, with the clock chiming the last stroke of midnight, we came out together and I closed my door behind me. There was no light on the stair, but our conversation, Mr. LaRue was speaking in a very high-pitched voice. What was he saying? He was explaining to me how some woman, unknown to him, had interrupted his work a few minutes before by ringing his doorbell. Inspector Dunbar held up his hand. I won't ask you to repeat what he said, Doctor, Mr. LaRue presently, can give me his own words. We had descended to this floor then, resumed Cumberly, when Mr. Exel entering below called up to us, asking if anything was the matter. LaRue replied, Matter, Exel, there's a devil of a business. For mercy's sake, come up. Well, Mr. Exel thereupon joined us at the door of this flat. Was it open? Yes. Mr. LaRue had rushed up to me, leaving the door open behind him. The light was out, both in the lobby and in the study, a fact upon which I commented at the time. It was all the more curious as Mr. LaRue had left both lights on. Did he say so? He did. The circumstances surprised him to a marked degree. We came in and I turned up the light in the lobby. Then LaRue, entering the study, turned up the light there too. I entered next, followed by Mr. Exel, and we saw the body lying where you see it now. Who saw it first? Mr. LaRue. He drew my attention to it, saying that he had left her lying on the Chesterfield and not upon the floor. You examined her? I did. She was dead, but still warm. She exhibited signs of recent illness and of being addicted to some drug habit, probably morphine. This, beyond doubt, contributed to her death, but the direct cause was asphyxiation she had been strangled. My God, groaned LaRue, dropping his face into his hands. You found marks on her throat. The marks were very slight. No great pressure was required in her weak condition. You did not move the body. Certainly not, a more complete examination must be made, of course but I extracted a piece of torn paper from her clenched right hand. Inspector Dunbar lowered his tufted brows. I'm not glad to know you did that, he said. It should have been left. It was done on the spur of the moment, but without altering the position of the hand or arm. The paper lies upon the table yonder. Inspector Dunbar took a long drink. Thus far he had made no attempt to examine the victim. Pulling out a bulging note case from the inside pocket of his blue serge coat, he unscrewed a fountain pen, carefully tested the nib upon his thumbnail, 
and made three or four brief entries. Then, stretching out one long arm, he laid the wallet and the pen beside his glass upon the top of a bookcase, without otherwise changing his position, and glancing aside at Axel said, Now, Mr. Axel, what help can you give us? I have little to add to Dr. Cumberley's account, answered Axel offhandedly. The whole thing seemed to me... What it seemed, interrupted Dunbar, does not interest Scotland Yard, Mr. Axel, and won't interest the jury. Larue glanced up for a moment, then set his teeth hard, so that his jaw muscles stood out prominently under the pallid skin. What do you want to know, then? asked Axel. I will be wanting to know, said Dunbar, where you were coming from tonight. From the House of Commons. You came direct. I left Sir Brian Malpas at the corner of Victoria Street at four minutes to twelve by Big Ben and walked straight home, actually entering here from the street. As the clock was chiming the last stroke of midnight, then you would have walked up the street from an easterly direction? Certainly. Did you meet anyone or anything? A taxi cab, empty for the hood, was lowered past me as I turned the corner. There was no other vehicle in the street and no person. You don't know from which door the cab came? As I turned the corner, replied Axel, I heard the man starting his engine, although when I actually saw the cab, it was in motion, but judging by the sound to which I refer, the cab had been stationary, if not at the door of Palace Mansions, certainly at that of the next block St. Andrew's Mansions. Did you hear or see anything else? I saw nothing whatever, but just as I approached the street door, I heard a peculiar whistle, apparently proceeding from the gardens in the center of the square. I attached no importance to it at the time. What kind of whistle? I have forgotten the actual notes, but the effect was very odd in some way. In what way? An impression of this sort is not entirely reliable, Inspector, but it struck me as oriental. Ah, said Dunbar, and reached out the long arm for his notebook. Can I be of any further assistance? said Axel, glancing at his watch. You had entered the hallway and were about to enter your own flat when the voices of Dr. Cumberley and Mr. LaRue attracted your attention. I actually had the key in my hand, replied Axel. Did you actually have the key in the lock? Let me think, mused Axel, and he took out a bunch of keys and dangled them reflectively before his eyes. No, I was fumbling for the right key when I heard the voices above me. But were you facing your door? No, averred Axel, perceiving the drift of the inspector's inquiries. I was facing the stairway the whole time, and although it was in darkness, there is a street lamp immediately outside on the pavement, and I can swear positively that no one descended, that there was no one in the hall nor on the stair, except Mr. LaRue and Dr. Cumberley. Ah, said Dunbar again, and made further entries in his book. I need not trouble you further, sir. Good night. Axel, despite his earlier attitude of boredom, now ignored this official dismissal and, tossing the stump of his cigar into the grate, lighted a cigarette and, with both hands thrust deep in his pockets, stood leaning back against the mantelpiece. The detective turned to LaRue. Have a brandy and soda? suggested Dr. Cumberley, his eyes turned upon the pathetic face of the novelist. But LaRue shook his head wearily. Go ahead, Inspector, he said. I am anxious to tell you all I know. God knows I am anxious to tell you. A sound was heard of a key being inserted in the lock of a door. Four pairs of curious eyes were turned toward the entrance lobby when the door opened, and a sleek man of medium height, clean-shaven, but with his hair cut low upon the cheekbones, so as to give the impression of short side whiskers, entered in a manner at once furtive and servile. He wore a black overcoat and a bowler hat, Reclosing the door, he turned, perceived the group in the study, and fell back as though someone had struck him a fierce blow. Abject terror was written upon his features, and, for a moment, the idea of flight appeared to suggest itself urgently to him. But finally, he took a step forward toward the study. "'Who's this?' snapped Dunbar, without removing his leonine eyes from the newcomer. "'It is Soames,' came the weary voice of LaRue. "'Butler. Yes.' Where's he been? I don't know. He remained out without my permission. He did, eh? Inspector Dunbar thrust forth a long finger at the shrinking form in the doorway. Mr. Soames, he said, 
You will be going to your own room and waiting there until I ring for you. Yes, sir, said Soames, holding his hat in both bands and speaking huskily. Yes, sir, certainly, sir. He crossed the lobby and disappeared. There is no other way out, is there? inquired the detective, glancing at Dr. Cumberley. There is no other way, was the reply. But surely you don't suspect. I would suspect the Archbishop of Westminster, snapped Dunbar, if he came in like that. Now, sir, he turned to LaRue. You were alone here, tonight. Quite alone, Inspector. The truth is I fear that my servants take liberties in the absence of my wife. In the absence of your wife? Where is your wife? She is in Paris. Is she a French woman? No, oh no. But my wife is a painter, you understand, and her I met her in Paris, sir. Must you insist upon these domestic particulars, Inspector? If Mr. Exel is anxious to turn in, replied the Inspector, after his no doubt exhausting duties at the house, and if Dr. Cumberley... I have no secrets from Cumberley, interjected LaRue. The doctor has known me almost from boyhood, but a uh, turning to the politician, don't you know, Exel, no offence, no offence. My dear LaRue, responded Exel hastily, I am the offender. Permit me to wish you all good night. He crossed the study, and at the door paused and turned. Rely upon me, LaRue, he said, to help in any way within my power. He crossed the lobby, opened the outer door, and departed. Now, Mr. LaRue, resumed Dunbar, about this matter of your wife's absence. Chapter 4 A Window is Opened Whilst Henry LaRue collected his thoughts, Dr. Cumberley glanced across at the writing table where lay the fragment of paper which had been clutched in the dead woman's hand, then turned his head again toward the inspector, staring at him curiously. Since Dunbar had not yet attempted even to glance at the strange message, he wondered what had prompted the present line of inquiry. My wife, began LaRue, shared a studio in Paris at the time that I met her with an American lady, a very talented portrait painter, era Miss Denise Ryland. You may know her name, but of course you don't know. Well, my wife is herself quite clever with her brush. In fact, she has exhibited more than once at the Paris Salon. We agreed at a, the time of our, of our engagement that she should be free to visit her old artistic friends in Paris at any time. You understand, there was to be no let or hindrance. Is this really necessary, Inspector? Pray go on, Mr. LaRue. Well, you understand, it was a give-and-take arrangement, because I am afraid that I, myself, demand certain sacrifices from my wife and her. I did not feel entitled to interfere. You see, Inspector interrupted Dr. Cumberley. They are a bohemian pair, and bohemians inevitably bore one another at times. This little arrangement was intended as a safety valve. Whenever Ennui attacked Mrs. LaRue, she was at liberty to depart for a week to her own friends in Paris. Leaving LaRue to the bachelor's existence, which is really his proper state, to go unshaven and unshorn, to dine upon bread and cheese and onions, to work until all hours of the morning and generally to enjoy himself. Does she usually stay long? inquired Dunbar. Not more than a week, as a rule, answered LaRue. You must excuse me, continued the detective, if I seem to pry into intimate matters, but on these occasions, how does Mrs. LaRue get on for money? I have opened a credit for her, explained the novelist wearily. At the Credit Lyonnais in Paris, Dunbar scribbled busily in his notebook, does she take her maid with her? He jerked, suddenly. She has no maid at the moment, replied LaRue. She has been without one for twelve months or more now. When did you last hear from her? Three days ago. Did you answer the letter? Yes, my answer was amongst the mail which Soames took to the post tonight. You said, though, if I remember rightly, that he was out without permission. LaRue ran his fingers through his hair. I meant that he should only have been absent five minutes or so, whilst he remained out for more than an hour. Inspector Dunbar nodded, comprehendingly, tapping his teeth with the head of the fountain pen. And the other servants? There are only two, a cook and a maid. I released them for the evening glad to get rid of them wanted to work. They are late. They take liberties, damnable liberties, because I am easygoing. I see, said Dunbar. 
so that you were quite alone this evening when he nodded in the direction of the writing table. Your visitor came? Quite alone. Was her arrival the first interruption? No, not exactly, Miss Cumberly. My daughter, explained Dr. Cumberly, knowing that Mr. LaRue at these times was very neglectful in regard to meals, prepared him an omelette and brought it down in a chafing dish. How long did she remain? asked the inspector of LaRue. I did not exactly open the door. We chatted, threw her through the letterbox, and she left the omelette outside on the landing. What time would that be? It was a quarter to twelve, declared Cumberly. I had been supping with some friends and returned to find Helen, my daughter, engaged in preparing the omelette. I congratulated her upon the happy thought, knowing that LaRue was probably starving himself. I see. The omelette, though, seems to be upset here on the floor, said the inspector. Cumberly briefly explained how it came to be there, LaRue punctuating his friend's story with affirmative nods. Then the door of the flat was open all the time, cried Dunbar. Yes, replied Cumberly, but whilst Excel and I searched the other rooms, and our search was exhaustive, mister, LaRue remained here in the study, and in full view of the lobby, as you see for yourself. No living thing, said LaRue monotonously, left this flat from the time that the three of us, Exel, Cumberly and I, entered, up to the time that Miss Cumberly came, and with the doctor went out again. Hmm, said the inspector, making notes. It appears so, certainly. I will ask you then, for your own account, Mr. LaRue, of the arrival of the woman in the civet furs. Pay special attention. He pointed with his fountain pen to the time at which the various incidents occurred. LaRue, growing calmer as he proceeded with the strange story, complied with the inspector's request. He had practically completed his account when the doorbell rang. It's the servants, said Dr. Cumberly. Soames will open the door. But Soames did not appear. The ringing being repeated, I told him to remain in his room, said Dunbar, until I rang for him, I remember. I will open the door, said Cumberly. And tell the servants to stay in the kitchen, snapped Dunbar. Dr. Cumberly opened the door, admitting the cook and housemaid. There has been an unfortunate accident, he said, but not to your master. You need not be afraid, but be good enough to remain in the kitchen for the present. Peeping in furtively as they passed, the two women crossed the lobby and went to their own quarters. Mr. Soames next, muttered Dunbar, and glancing at Cumberly as he returned from the lobby, will you ring for him, he requested. Dr. Cumberly nodded and pressed a bell beside the mantelpiece. An interval followed, in which the inspector made notes and Cumberly stood looking at LaRue, who was beating his palms upon his knees and staring unseeingly before him. Cumberly rang again, and in response to the second ring, the housemaid appeared at the door. I rang for Soames, said Dr. Cumberly. He's not in, sir, answered the girl. Inspector Dunbar started as though he had been bitten. What? he cried, not in. No, sir, said the girl, with wide-open, frightened eyes. Dunbar turned to Cumberly. You said there was no other way out. There is no other way, to my knowledge. Where's his room? Cumberly led the way to a room at the end of a short corridor, and Inspector Dunbar, entering and turning up the light, glanced about the little apartment. It was a very neat servant's bedroom, with comfortable, quite simple furniture, but the chest of drawers had been hastily ransacked, and the contents of a trunk, or some of its contents, lay strewn about the floor. He has packed his grip, came LaRue's voice from the doorway. It's gone. The window was wide open. Dunbar sprang forward and leaned out over the ledge, looking to right and left, above and below. A sort of square courtyard was beneath, and for the convenience of tradesmen, a handlift was constructed outside the kitchens of the three flats comprising the house, i.e. Mr. Exel's ground floor, Henry LaRue's second floor, and Dr. Cumberley's top. It worked in a skeleton shaft which passed close to the left of Soames's window. For an active man, this was a good enough ladder, and the inspector withdrew his head, shrugging his square shoulders irritably. My fault entirely, he muttered, biting his wiry moustache, I should have come and seen for myself if there was another way out. LaRue 
in a new flutter of excitement, now craned from the window. It might be possible to climb down the shaft, he cried after a brief survey, but not if one were carrying a heavy grip, such as that which he has taken. Pfft, <clears throat> said Dunbar. You are a writing gentleman, I understand, and yet it does not occur to you that he could have lowered the bag on a cord if he wanted to avoid the noise of dropping it. Yes, sir, of course, muttered Larue. But really, but really, oh, good God, I am bewildered. What in heaven's name does it all mean? It means trouble, replied Dunbar grimly. Bad trouble. They returned to the study, and Inspector Dunbar, for the first time since his arrival, walked across and examined the fragmentary message, raising his eyebrows when he discovered that it was written upon the same paper as Larue's MSS. He glanced, too, at the pen lying on a page of Martin Zeder near the lamp, and at the inky splash which told how hastily the pen had been dropped. Then, his brows drawn together, he stooped to the body of the murdered woman. Partially raising the fur cloak, he suppressed a gasp of astonishment. Why? She only wears a silk nightdress and a pair of suede slippers. He glanced back over his shoulder. I had noted that, said Cumberly. The whole business is utterly extraordinary. Extraordinary is no word for it, growled the inspector, pursuing his examination. Marks of pressure at the throat, yes, and generally unhealthy appearance. Due to the drug habit, interjected Dr. Cumberly. What drug? I should not like to say out of hand, possibly morphine. No jewellery, continued the detective musingly. Wedding ring, not a new one. Fingernails well cared for, but recently neglected. Hair dyed to hide grey patches. Dye wanted renewing. Shoes. French. Night robe. Silk. Good lace. Probably French also. Faint perfume, don't know what it is. Apparently proceeding from civet fur. Furs. Magnificent. Very costly. He slightly moved the table lamp in order to direct its light upon the white face. The bloodless lips were parted and the detective bent, closely peering at the teeth thus revealed. Her teeth were oddly discoloured, Doctor, he said, taking out a magnifying glass and examining them closely. They had been recently scaled, too, so that she was not in the habit of neglecting them. Dr. Cumberly nodded. The drug habit again, he said guardedly. A proper examination will establish the full facts. The inspector added brief notes to those already made ere he rose from beside the body. Then you are absolutely certain, he said deliberately, facing LaRue, that you had never set eyes on this woman prior to her coming here tonight. I can swear it, said LaRue. Good, replied the detective, and closed his notebook with a snap. Usual formalities will have to be gone through, but I don't think I need trouble you gentlemen any further tonight. Chapter 5 Doctors Differ Dr. Cumberly walked slowly upstairs to his own flat, a picture etched indelibly upon his mind of Henry LaRue with a face of despair, sitting below in his dining room and listening to the ominous sounds proceeding from the study, where the police were now busily engaged. In the lobby he met his daughter Helen, who was waiting for him in a state of nervous suspense. Father, she began, whilst rebuke died upon the doctor's lips, tell me quickly what has happened. Perceiving that an explanation was unavoidable, Dr. Cumberly outlined the story of the night's gruesome happenings, whilst Big Ben began to chime the hour of one. Helen, eager-eyed, and with her charming face rather pale, hung upon every word of the narrative. And now, concluded her father, you must go to bed. I insist. But father, cried the girl, there is something. She hesitated uneasily. Well, Helen, Go on, said the doctor. I am afraid you will refuse. At least give me the opportunity. Well, in the glimpse, the half-glimpse, which I had of her, I seemed. Dr. Cumberly rested his hands upon his daughter's shoulders characteristically, looking into the troubled grey eyes. You don't mean, he began. I thought I recognized her, whispered the girl. Good God, can it be possible? I have been trying ever since to recall where we had met, but without result. It might mean so much, Doctor. Cumberly regarded her fixedly. It might mean so much to Mr. LaRue, 
but I suppose you will say it is impossible. It is impossible, said Dr. Cumberly firmly. Dismiss the idea, Helen. But father, pleaded the girl, placing her hands over his own, consider what is at stake. I am anxious that you should not become involved in this morbid business, but you surely know me better than to expect me to faint or become hysterical or anything silly like that. I was certainly shocked when I came down tonight because, well, it was all so frightfully unexpected. Dr. Cumberly shook his head. Helen put her arms about his neck and raised her eyes to his. You have no right to refuse, she said softly. Don't you see that? Dr. Cumberly frowned. Then, you are right, Helen, he agreed. I should know your pluck well enough. But if Inspector Dunbar is gone, the police may refuse to admit us. Then let us hurry, cried Helen. I am afraid they will take away. Side by side they descended to Henry LaRue's flat, ringing the bell, which an hour earlier the Lady of the Civet Furs had rung. A sergeant in uniform opened the door. Is Detective Inspector Dunbar here? inquired the physician. Yes, sir. Say that Dr. Cumberly wishes to speak to him, and as the man was about to depart request him not to arouse Mr. LaRue, almost immediately the inspector appeared, a look of surprise upon his face, which increased on perceiving the girl beside her father. This is my daughter, Inspector, explained Cumberly. She is a contributor to the planet and to various magazines, and in this journalistic capacity meets many people in many walks of life. She thinks she may be of use to you in preparing your case. Dunbar bowed rather awkwardly. Glad to meet you, Miss Cumberly, came the inevitable formula. Entirely at your service. I had an idea, Inspector, said the girl, laying her hand confidentially upon Dunbar's arm, that I recognized when I entered Mr. LaRue's study. Tonight Dunbar nodded that I recognized the, the victim. Good, said the inspector, rubbing his palms briskly together. His tawny eyes sparkled. And you would wish to see her again before we take her away. Very plucky of you, Miss Cumberly. But then you are a doctor's daughter. They entered, and the inspector closed the door behind them. Don't arouse Paul LaRue whispered Cumberly to the detective. I left him on a couch in the dining room. He is still there, replied Dunbar. Poor chap, it is. He met Helen's glance and broke off shortly. In the study two uniformed constables and an officer in plain clothes were apparently engaged in making an inventory, or such was the impression conveyed. The clock ticked merrily on, its ticking a desecration where all else was hushed in deference to the grim visitor. The body of the murdered woman had been laid upon the Chesterfield, and a little dark bearded man was conducting an elaborate examination. When, seeing the trio enter, he hastily threw the coat of civet fur over the body and stood up, facing the intruders. It's all right, doctor, said the inspector, and we shan't detain you a moment. He glanced over his shoulder. Mr. Hilton... MRCS, he said, indicating the dark man Dr. Cumberly and Miss Cumberly. The divisional surgeon bowed to Helen and eagerly grasped the hand of the celebrated physician. I am fortunate in being able to ask your opinion, he began. Dr. Cumberly nodded shortly and with upraised hand cut him short. I shall willingly give you any assistance in my power, he said but my daughter has voluntarily committed herself to a rather painful ordeal, and I am anxious to get it over. He stooped and raised the fur from the ghastly face. Helen, her hand resting upon her father's shoulder, ventured one rapid glance and then looked away, shuddering slightly. Dr. Cumberly replaced the coat and gazed anxiously at his daughter. But Helen, with admirable courage, having closed her eyes for a moment, reopened them and smiled at her father's anxiety. She was pale, but perfectly composed. Well, Miss Cumberly, inquired the inspector eagerly, whilst all in the room watched this slim girl in her charming dishabille, this dainty figure so utterly out of place in that scene of morbid crime, she raised her grey eyes to the detective. I still believe that I have seen the face somewhere before, but I shall have to reflect a while. I meet so many folks, you know, in a casual way, before I can commit myself to any statement. 
In the leonine eyes looking into hers gleamed the light of admiration and approval. The canny Scotsman admired this girl for her beauty, as a matter of course, for her courage, because courage was a quality standing high in his estimation, but above all, for her admirable discretion. Very proper, Miss Cumberley, he said, very proper and wise on your part. I don't wish to hurry you in any way, but he hesitated, glancing at the man in plain clothes, who had now resumed a careful perusal of a newspaper, but her name doesn't happen to be Vernon. Vernon, cried the girl, her eyes lighting up at sound of the name. Mrs. Vernon, it is, it is. She was pointed out to me at the last arts ball, where she appeared in a most monstrous Chinese costume. Chinese? inquired Dunbar, producing the bulky notebook. Yes. Oh, poor, poor soul. You know nothing further about her, Miss Cumberley. Nothing, Inspector. She was merely pointed out to me as one of the strangest figures in the hall. Her husband, I understand, is an art expert. He was, said Dunbar, closing the book sharply. He died this afternoon, and a paragraph announcing his death appears in the newspaper which we found in the victim's fur coat. But how? It was the only paragraph on the half-page folded outwards which was in any sense. Personal. I am greatly indebted to you, Miss Cumberley. Every hour wasted on a case like this means a fresh plait in the rope around the neck of the wrong man. Helen Cumberley grew slowly quite pallid. Good night, she said, and bowing to the detective and to the surgeon, she prepared to depart. Mr. Hilton touched Dr. Cumberley's arm as he too was about to retire. May I hope, he whispered, that you will return and give me the benefit of your opinion in making out my report. Dr. Cumberley glanced at his daughter, and seeing her to be perfectly composed for the moment, I have formed no opinion, Mr. Hilton, he said quietly, not having had an opportunity to conduct a proper examination. Hilton bent and whispered confidentially in the other's ear, she was drugged. The innuendo underlying the words struck Dr. Cumberley forcibly, and he started back with his brows drawn together in a frown. Do you mean that she was addicted to the use of drugs? He asked sharply, or that the drugging took place tonight? The drugging did take place tonight, whispered the other. An injection was made in the left shoulder with a hypodermic syringe. The mark is quite fresh. Dr. Cumberley glared at his fellow practitioner angrily. Are there no other marks of injection? he asked. On the left forearm, yes. Obviously self-administered. Oh, I don't deny the habit. But my point is this. The injection in the shoulder was not self-administered. Come, Helen, said Cumberley, taking his daughter's arm, for she had drawn near. During the colloquy, you must get to bed. His face was very stern when he turned again to Mr. Hilton. I shall return in a few minutes, he said, and escorted his daughter from the room. Chapter 6 at Scotland Yard. Matters of vital importance to some people whom already we have met, and to others whom thus far we have not met, were transacted in a lofty and rather bleak-looking room at Scotland Yard between the hours of 9 and 10 a. m. That is, later in the morning of the fateful day, whose advent we have heard acclaimed from the Tower of Westminster. The room, which was lighted by a large French window opening upon a balcony, commanded an excellent view of the Thames embankment. The floor was polished to a degree of brightness, almost painful. The distempered walls, save for a severe and solitary etching of a former commissioner, were nude in all their unloveliness. A heavy deal table, upon which rested a blotting pad, a pewter ink pot, several newspapers and two pens together with three deal chairs, built rather as monuments of durability than as examples of art, constituted the only furniture, if we accept an electric lamp with a green glass shade, above the table. This was the room of Detective Inspector Dunbar, and Detective Inspector Dunbar, at the hour of our entrance, will be found seated in the chair, placed behind the table, his elbows resting upon the blotting pad. At ten minutes past nine, exactly, the door opened, and a thick-set, florid man, buttoned up in a fawn-coloured raincoat and wearing a bowler hat of obsolete build, entered. He possessed a black moustache, a breezy, bustling manner, and humorous blue eyes. Furthermore, 
when he took off his hat, he revealed the possession of a head of very bristly upstanding black hair. This was Detective Sergeant Sowerby, and the same who was engaged in examining a newspaper in the study of Henry LaRue when Dr. Cumberley and his daughter had paid their second visit to that scene of an unhappy soul's dismissal. Well, said Dunbar, glancing up at his subordinate inquiringly. I have done all the cab depots, reported Sergeant Sowerby, and a good many of the private owners, but so far the man seen by Mr. Exel has not turned up. The word will be passed round now, though, said Dunbar, and we shall probably have him here during the day. I hope so, said the other good-humouredly, seating himself upon one of the two chairs ranged beside the wall. If he doesn't show up. Well, jerked Dunbar if he doesn't, it will look very black against LaRue. Dunbar drummed upon the blotting pad with the fingers of his left hand. It beats anything of the kind that has ever come my way, he confessed. You get pretty cautious at weighing people up in this business. But I certainly don't think, mind you. I go no further, but I certainly don't think Mr. Henry LaRue would willingly kill a fly, yet there is circumstantial evidence enough to hang him. Sergeant Sowerby nodded, gazing speculatively at the floor. I wonder, he said slowly, why the girl Miss Cumberly hesitated about telling us the woman's name. I am not wondering about that at all, replied Dunbar. Bluntly, she must meet thousands in the same way. The wonder to me is that she remembered at all. I am open to bet half a crown that you couldn't remember the name of every woman you happen to have pointed out to you at an arts. Ball? Maybe not, agreed Sowerby. She's a smart girl, I'll allow. I see you have last night's papers there. I have, replied Dunbar, and I'm wondering if there's any connection. Well, continued the inspector, it looks on the face of it as though the news of her husband's death had something to do with Mrs. Vernon's presence at LaRue's flat. It's not a natural thing for a woman, on the evening of her husband's death, to rush straight away to another man's place. It's strange we couldn't find her clothes. It's not strange at all. You're simply obsessed with the idea that this was a love intrigue. Think, man. The most abandoned woman wouldn't run to keep an appointment with a lover at a time like that. And remember, she had the news in her pocket. She came to that flat dressed or undressed, just as we found her, I'm sure of it. And a point like that sometimes means the difference between hanging and acquittal. Sergeant Sowerby digested these words, composing his jovial countenance in an expression of unnatural profundity. Then, the point to my mind, he said, is the one raised by Mr. Hilton, by gum. Didn't Dr. Cumberley tell him off? Dr. Cumberley, replied Dunbar, is entitled to his opinion that the injection in the woman's shoulder was at least eight hours old, whilst Mr. Hilton is equally entitled to maintain that it was less than one hour old. Neither of them can hope to prove his case. If either of them could, it might make a difference to the evidence, but I'm not sure. What time is your appointment? Ten o'clock, replied Dunbar. I am meeting Mr. Debnam, the late Mr. Vernon's solicitor. There is something in it. Damn, I am sure of it. Something in what? The fact that Mr. Vernon died yesterday evening and that his wife was murdered at midnight. What have you told the press? As little as possible, but you will see that the early editions will all be screaming for the arrest of Soames. I shouldn't wonder. He would be a useful man to have, but he's probably out of London now. I think not. He's more likely to wait for instructions from his principal. His principal? Certainly. You don't think Soames did the murder, do you? No, but he's obviously an accessory. I'm not so sure even of that. Then why did he bolt? Because he had a guilty conscience? Yes, agreed Sowerby. It does turn out that way sometimes. At any rate, Stringer is after him, but he's got next to nothing to go upon. Has any reply been received from Mrs. LaRue in Paris? No, answered Dunbar, frowning thoughtfully. Her husband's wire would reach her first thing this morning. I am expecting to hear of a reply at any moment. They're a funny couple altogether, said Sowerby. I can't imagine myself standing for Mrs. Sowerby spending her weekends in Paris. Asking for trouble, I call it. It does seem a daft arrangement, agreed Dunbar. But then, as you say, they're a funny couple. 
I never saw such a bundle of nerves in all my life. LaRue? Sowerby nodded. I suppose, he said, it's the artistic temperament. If Mrs. LaRue has got it too, I don't wonder that they get fed up with one another's company. That's about the secret of it. And now I shall be glad, Sowerby, if you will be after that taxi man again. Report at one o'clock. I shall be here. With his hand on the doorknob, By the way, said Sowerby, who the blazes is Mr. King? Inspector Dunbar looked up. Mr. King, he replied slowly, is the solution of the mystery. Chapter 7. The Man in the Limousine The house of the late Horace Vernon was a modern villa of prosperous appearance, but on this sunny September morning, a palpable atmosphere of gloom seemed to overlie it. This made itself perceptible even to the toughened and unimpressionable nerves of Inspector Dunbar. As he mounted the five steps leading up to the door, glancing meanwhile at the lowered blinds at the windows, he wondered if, failing these evidences and his own private knowledge of the facts, he should have recognized that the hand of tragedy had placed its mark upon this house. But when the door was opened by a white-faced servant, he told himself that he should, for a veritable miasma of death seemed to come out to meet him, to envelop him. Within proceeded a subdued activity, somber figures moved upon the staircase, and Inspector Dunbar, having presented his card, presently found himself in a well-appointed library. At the table, whereon were spread a number of documents, sat a lean, clean-shaven, sallow-faced man, wearing gold-rimmed pince-nez, a man whose demeanour of business-like gloom was most admirably adapted to that place and occasion. This was Mr. Debnam, the solicitor. He gravely waved the detective to an armchair, adjusted his pince-nez, and coughed introductorily. "'Your communication, Inspector,' he began. He had the kind of voice which seems to be buried in sawdust packing. "'Was brought to me this morning, and has disturbed me immeasurably, unspeakably. "'You have been to view the body, sir.' One of my clerks, who knew Mrs. Vernon, has just returned to this house to report that he has identified her. I should have preferred you to have gone yourself, sir, began Dunbar, taking out his notebook. My state of health, Inspector, said the solicitor, renders it undesirable that I should submit myself to an ordeal so unnecessary, so wholly unnecessary. Very good, muttered Dunbar, making an entry in his book, your clerk, then, whom I can see in a moment, identifies the murdered woman as Mrs. Vernon. What was her Christian name? Iris Iris Mary Vernon. Inspector Dunbar made a note of the fact. And now, he said, you will have read the copy of that portion of my report which I submitted to you this morning, acting upon information supplied by Miss Helen Cumberley. Yes, yes, Inspector, I have read it, but, by the way, I do not know Miss Cumberley. Miss Cumberley, explained the detective, is the daughter of Dr. Cumberley, the Harley Street physician. She lives with her father in the flat above that of Mr. LaRue. She saw the body by accident and recognized it as that of a lady who had been named to her at the last arts ball. Ah, said Debnam. Yes, I see, at the arts ball, Inspector. This is a mysterious and a very ghastly case. It is indeed, sir, agreed Dunbar. Can you throw any light upon the presence of Mrs. Vernon at Mr. LaRue's flat on the very night of her husband's death? I can, and I cannot, answered the solicitor, leaning back in the chair, and again adjusting his pince-nez, in the manner of a man having important matters and gloomy, very gloomy, matters to communicate. Good, said the inspector, and prepared to listen. You see, continued Debnam, the late Mrs. Vernon was not actually residing with her husband at the date of his death, Indeed. Ostensibly, the solicitor shook a lean forefinger at his vis-a-vis -vis ostensibly, Inspector. She was visiting her sister in Scotland. Inspector Dunbar sat up very straight, his brows drawn down over the tawny eyes. These visits were a frequent occurrence, and usually of about a week's duration. Mr. Vernon, my late client, a man, I'll not deny it, of inconstant affections. You understand me, Inspector? did not greatly concern himself with his wife's movements. She belonged to a smart bohemian set, and to use a popular figure of speech, burnt the candle at both ends. Late dances, nightclubs, bridge parties and other feverish pursuits, possibly taken up as a result of the 
shall I say, cooling, of her husband's affections, there was another woman in the case. I fear so, Inspector, in fact, I am sure of it, but to return to Mrs. Vernon, my client provided her with ample funds, and I, myself, have expressed to him astonishment respecting her expenditures in Scotland. I understand that her sister was in comparatively poor circumstances, and I went so far as to point out to Mr. Vernon that one hundred pounds was, shall I say, an excessive outlay upon a week's sojourn in Orcteranda. Perth, a hundred pounds, a hundred pounds. Was it queried by Mr. Vernon? Not at all. Was Mr. Vernon personally acquainted with his sister in Perth? He was not, Inspector. Mrs. Vernon, at the time of her marriage, did not enjoy that social status to which my late client elevated her. For many years she held no open communication with any member of her family, but latterly, as I have explained, she acquired the habit of recuperating, recuperating from the effects of her febrile pleasures at this obscure place in Scotland. And Mr. Vernon, his interest in her movements having considerably, shall I say abated, offered no objection, even suffered it gladly, counting the cost but little against. Freedom! suggested Dunbar, scribbling in his notebook. Rather crudely expressed, perhaps, said the solicitor, peering over the top of his glasses, but you have the idea. I come now to my client's awakening. Four days ago he learned the truth. He learned that he was being deceived. Deceived! Mrs. Vernon, thoroughly exhausted with irregular living, announced that she was about to resort once more to the healing breezes of the heather land. Mr. Debnam was thoroughly warming to his discourse and thoroughly enjoying his own dusty phrases. Interrupting you for a moment, said the inspector, at what intervals did these visits take place? At remarkably regular intervals, inspector, something like six times a year. For how long had Mrs. Vernon made a custom of these visits? Roughly for two years. Thank you. Will you go on, sir? She requested Mr. Vernon then on the last occasion to give her a cheque for eighty pounds, and this he did unquestioningly. On Thursday, the 2nd of September, she left for Scotland. Did she take her maid? Her maid always received a holiday on these occasions. Mrs. Vernon wired her respecting the date of her return. Did anyone actually see her off? No, not that I am aware of, Inspector. To put the whole thing quite bluntly, Mr. Debnam, said Dunbar, fixing his tawny eyes upon the solicitor. Mr. Vernon was thoroughly glad to get rid of her for a week. Mr. Debnam shifted uneasily in his chair. The truculent directness of the detective was unpleasing to his tortuous mind. However, I fear you have hit upon the truth, he confessed, and I must admit that we have no legal evidence of her leaving for Scotland on this or on any other occasion. Letters were received from Perth, and letters sent to Orcteranda from London were answered. But the truth, the painful truth, came to light, unexpectedly, dramatically, on Monday last. Four days ago? Exactly, three days before the death of my client. Mr. Debnam wagged his finger at the inspector again. I maintain, he said, that this painful discovery, which I am about to mention, precipitated my client's end although it is a fact that there was hereditary heart trouble. But I admit that his neglect of his wife, to give it no harsher name, contributed to the catastrophe. He paused to give dramatic point to the revelation. Walking homeward at a late hour on Monday evening from a flat in Victoria Street, the flat of, shall I employ the term a particular friend, Mr. Vernon was horrified, horrified beyond measure, to perceive, in a large and well-appointed car, a limousine, his wife. The inside lights of the car were on then? No, but the light from a street lamp shone directly into the car. A temporary block in the traffic compelled the driver of the car, whom my client described to me as an Asiatic, to pull up for a moment. There, within a few yards of her husband, Mrs. Vernon reclined in the car, or rather in the arms of a male companion. What? Positively, Mr. Debnam was sedately enjoying himself. Positively, my dear inspector, in the arms of a man of extremely dark complexion, Mr. Vernon was unable to perceive more than this, for the man had his back toward him. But the light shone fully upon the face of Mrs. Vernon, who appeared pale and exhausted. She wore a conspicuous motor coat of civet fur, and it was this which first attracted Mr. Vernon's attention. 
The blow was a very severe one to a man in my client's state of health, and although I cannot claim that his own conscience was clear, this open violation of the marriage vows outraged the husband outraged him. In fact, he was so perturbed that he stood there shaking, quivering, unable to speak or act, and the car drove away before he had recovered sufficient presence of mind to note the number. In which direction did the car proceed? Toward Victoria Station. Any other particulars? Not regarding the car, its driver, or its occupants. But early on the following morning, Mr. Vernon, very much shaken, called upon me and instructed me to dispatch an agent to Perth immediately. My agent's report reached me at practically the same time as the news of my client's death, and his report was, his report, Inspector, telegraphic of course, was this, that no sister of Mrs. Vernon resided at the address, that the place was a cottage occupied by a certain Mrs. Fry and her husband, that the husband was of no occupation, and had no visible means of support, he ticked off the points on the long forefinger, that the Frys lived better than any of their neighbours, and most important of all that Mrs. Fry's maiden name, which my agent discovered by recourse to the parish register of marriages, was Anne Fairchild. What of that? Anne Fairchild was a former maid of Mrs. Vernon. In short, it amounts to this, then, Mrs. Vernon, during these various absences, never went to Scotland at all. It was a conspiracy. Exactly, exactly, Inspector. I wired instructing my agent to extort from the woman Fry the address to which she forwarded letters received by her for Mrs. Vernon. The lady's death, news of which will now have reached him, will no doubt be a lever, enabling my representative to obtain the desired information. When do you expect to hear from him? At any moment. Failing a full confession by the Fry's, you will of course know how to act, Inspector. Damn, cried Dunbar. Can your man be relied upon to watch them? They mustn't slip away. Shall I instruct Perth to arrest the couple? I wired my agent this morning, Inspector, to communicate with the local police respecting the fries. Inspector Dunbar tapped his small, widely separated teeth with the end of his fountain pen. I've had one priceless witness slip through my fingers, he muttered. I'll hand in my resignation if the fries go. To whom do you refer? Inspector Dunbar rose. It is a point with which I need not trouble you, sir, he said. It was not included in the extract of report sent to you. This is going to be the biggest case of my professional career, or my name is not Robert Dunbar. Closing his notebook, he thrust it into his pocket and replaced his fountain pen in the little leather wallet. Of course, said the solicitor, rising in turn and adjusting the troublesome pince-nez, there was some intrigue with LaRue. So much is evident. You will be thinking that, eh? My dear inspector, Mr. Debnam, the wily, was seeking information, my dear inspector. LaRue's own wife was absent in Paris, quite a safe distance, and Mrs. Vernon, now proven to be a woman conducting a love intrigue, is found dead under most compromising circumstances, most compromising circumstances in his. Flat. His servants, even, are got safely out of the way for the evening. Quite so said Dunbar shortly. Quite so, Mr. Debnam. He opened the door. Might I see the late Mrs. Vernon's maid? She is at her home. As I told you, Mrs. Vernon habitually released her for the period of these absences. The notebook reappeared. The young woman's address. You can get it from the housekeeper. Is there anything else you wish to know? Nothing beyond that, thank you. Three minutes later, Inspector Dunbar had written in his book Clarice Goodstone, Care of Mrs. Hearn, 134, A Robert Street, Hampstead Road. N.W. he departed from the house where at death the gleaner had twice knocked with his scythe. Chapter 8. Cabman 2. Returning to Scotland Yard, Inspector Dunbar walked straight up to his own room. There he found Sowerby, very red-faced and humid, and a taximan who sat stolidly surveying the embankment from the window. Hello, cried Dunbar. He's turned up then? No, he hasn't, replied Sowerby with a mild irritation. But we know where to find him, and he ought to lose his license. The taximan turned hurriedly. He wore a muffler so tightly packed between his neck and the collar of his uniform jacket that it appeared materially to impair his respiration. 
His face possessed a bluish tinge, suggestive of asphyxia, and his watery eyes protruded remarkably. His breathing was noisily audible. No, chuck it, mister, he exclaimed. I'm only telling you because it ain't my line to play tricks on the police. You'll find my name in the books downstairs more than any other driver in London. I reckon I've brought enough umbrellas, cameras, walking sticks, hopper cloaks, watches and sick like in here to set up a blasted pawnbroker's. That's all right, my lad, said Dunbar, holding up his hand to silence the voluble speaker. There's going to be no license losing. You did not hear that you were wanted before. The watery eyes of the cabman protruded painfully. He respired like a horse. Me, governor, he exclaimed. Gore blime, I ain't the bloke. I was driving back from taking the Honourable Herbert Harding home, same as I does almost every night. When the houses are sitting, when I see old Tom Bryan drawing away from the Dora Palace man. Again Dunbar held up his hand. No doubt you mean well, he said. But damn, begin at the beginning. Who are you? And what have you come to tell us? Who are I? Is who I am? Wheezed the cabman, proffering a greasy license. Richard, Amper, Number Three Bream's Mews, Dulwich Village. That's all right, said Dunbar, thrusting back the proffered document. And last night you had taken Mr. Harding, the Member of Parliament, to his residence in. In Peer's Chambers, Westminster. That's it, Governor. Coming back. I have to pass along the north side of the square, and just to eat of me, I see old Tom Bryan a pulling round the Johnny Orner, him coming from Palace Mansions. Mr. Exel only mentioned seeing one cab, muttered Dunbar, glancing keenly aside at Sowerby. What you say, Governor? asked the cabman. I say, did you see a gentleman approaching from the corner? asked Dunbar. Yes, declared the man. I see him, but he hadn't got as far as the Johnny Orner. As I passed outside old Tom Bryan, Watts changing his gear, I see a bloke blowing along on the pavement, a bloke in a high hat and wearing a high glass. At this time then, pursued Dunbar, you had actually passed the other cab and the gentleman on the pavement had not come up with it. He couldn't see it, Governor. I'm telling you hadn't got to the Johnny Orner. I see, muttered Sowerby. It's possible that Mr. Exel took no notice of the first cab especially as it did not come out of the square. "'What you say, Governor?' queried the cabman again, turning his bleared eyes upon Sergeant Sowerby. "'He said,' interrupted Dunbar, "'was Brian's cab empty?' "'Course it was,' rapped Mr. Hamper. "'He'd just dropped his fare at Palace Mansions.' "'How do you know?' snapped Dunbar, suddenly, fixing his fierce eyes upon the face of the speaker. The cabman glared in beery truculence. I got me blasted senses, ain't I? he inquired. There's only two lots of flats on that side of the Square Palace Mansions and St. Andrew's Mansions. Well? St. Andrew's Mansions, continued Hamper, is all away, all away, all away. I know, cause I used to have a regular affair there. Ease in Egypt, flat shut up. Top floors to let. Bottom floors, two old unmarried maiden ladies, what always travels by bus. So does all their blasted friends and relations. Where can old Tom Bryan have been coming from if it wasn't Palace Mansions? Hmm, said Dunbar. You are a loss to the detective service, my lad. And how do you account for the fact that Bryan has not got to hear of the inquiry? Hamper bent to Dunbar and whispered beerily in his ear, Perhaps he don't want to ear, Governor. Oh, why not? Well, he knows there's something up there. Therefore it's his plain duty to assist the police. Same as what I does, cried Hamper, raising his eyebrows. Course it is. But how do you know he ain't been got at? Our friend here evidently has one up against Mr. Tom Bryan, muttered Dunbar aside to Sowerby. What you say, Governor? inquired the cabman, looking from one to the other. I say, no doubt you can save us the trouble of looking out Bryan's license and give us his private address, replied Dunbar. Course I can. E lives hat number 36 4th Street, Brixton, and E's out of the big Brixton depot. Oh, said Dunbar dryly, does he owe you anything? What you say, Governor? I say it's very good of you to take all this trouble, and whatever it has cost you in time, we shall be pleased to put right. Mr. Hamper spat in his right palm and rubbed his hands together appreciatively. 
Make it five, Bob, he said. Wait downstairs, directed Dunbar, pressing a bell push beside the door. I'll get it put through for you. Right-o, rumbled the cabman, and went lurching from the room as a constable in uniform appeared at the door. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, the cabman having departed, leaving in his wake a fragrant odour of fourpenny ale. Here you are, Sowerby, cried Dunbar. We are moving at last. This is the address of the late Mrs. Vernon's maid. See her, feel your ground, carefully, of course. Get to know what clothes Mrs. Vernon took with her on her periodical visits to Scotland. What clothes? That's the idea. It is important. I don't think the girl was in her mistress's confidence, but I leave it to you to find out. If circumstances point to my surmise being inaccurate, you know how to act. Just let me glance over your notes bearing on the matter, said Sowerby, and I'll be off. Dunbar handed him the bulging notebook, and Sergeant Sowerby lowered his inadequate eyebrows, thoughtfully, whilst he scanned the evidence of Mr. Debnam. Then, returning the book to his superior, and adjusting the peculiar bowler firmly upon his head, he set out. Dunbar glanced through some papers, apparently reports, which lay upon the table, penciled comments upon two of them, and then, consulting his notebook once more in order to refresh his memory, started off for Fourth Street. Brixton. Fourth Street, Brixton, is a depressing thoroughfare. It contains small, cheap flats and a number of frowsy-looking houses which give one the impression of having run to seed. A hostelry of sad aspect occupies a commanding position midway along the street, but inspires the traveller not with cheer, but with lugubrious reflections upon the horrors of inebriety. The odours, unpleasantly mingled, of fried bacon and paraffin oil, are wafted to the wayfarer from the porches of these family residences. Number 36 proved to be such a villa, and Inspector Dunbar contemplated it from a distance thoughtfully. As he stood by the door of the public house, gazing across the street, a tired-looking woman, lean and anxious-eyed, a poor, dried-up bean-pod of a woman, appeared from the door of number 36, carrying a basket. She walked along in the direction of the neighbouring high road, and Dunbar casually followed her. For some ten minutes he studied her activities, noting that she went from shop to shop until her basket was laden with provisions of all sorts. When she entered a wine and spirit merchant's, the detective entered close behind her, for the place was also a post office. Whilst he purchased a penny stamp and fumbled in his pocket for an imaginary letter, he observed with interest that the woman had purchased, and was loading into the hospitable basket, a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of rum, and a bottle of gin. He left the shop ahead of her, sure now of his ground, always provided that the woman proved to be Mrs. Bryan. Dunbar walked along 4th Street slowly enough to enable the woman to overtake him. At the door of number 36, he glanced up at the number questioningly and turned in the gate as she was about to enter. He raised his hat. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mrs. Bryan? Momentarily a hard look came into the tired eyes, but Dunbar's gentleness of manner and voice, together with the kindly expression upon his face, turned the scales favourably. "'I am Mrs. Bryan,' she said. "'Yes. Did you want to see me? On a matter of some importance, may I come in?' She nodded and led the way into the house the door was not closed. In a living room, whereon was written a pathetic history— a history of decline from easy circumstance and respectability to poverty and utter disregard of appearances. She confronted him, setting down her basket on a table from which the remains of a fish breakfast were not yet removed. "'Is your husband in?' inquired Dunbar with a subtle change of manner. "'He's lying down.' The hard look was creeping again into the woman's eyes. "'Will you please awake him and tell him that I have called in regard to his license?' He thrust a card into her hand, Detective Inspector Dunbar, C.I.D. New Scotland Yard. S.W. Chapter 9. The Man in Black. Mrs. Bryan started back, with a wild look, a trapped look in her eyes. What's he done? she inquired. What's he done? Tom's not done anything. Be good enough to waken him, persisted the inspector. I wish to speak to him. 
Mrs. Bryan walked slowly from the room and could be heard entering one further along the passage. An angry snarling, suggesting that of a wild animal disturbed in its lair, proclaimed the arousing of Taximan Thomas Bryan. A thick voice inquired, brutally, why the sanguinary hell he, Mr. Bryan, had had his bloodstained slumbers disturbed in this gory manner, and who was the vermilion blighter responsible. Then Mrs. Bryan's voice mingled with that of her husband, and both became subdued. Finally, a slim man who wore a short beard, or had omitted to shave for some days, appeared at the door of the living room. His face was another history upon the same subject as that which might be studied from the walls, the floor, and the appointments of the room. Inspector Dunbar perceived that the shadow of the neighbouring hostelry overlay this home. "'What's up?' inquired the new arrival. The tone of his voice, thickened by excess, was yet eloquent of the gentleman. The barriers passed. Your pariah gentleman can be the completest blackguard of them all. He spoke coarsely, and the infectious Cockney accent showed itself in his vowels. But Dunbar, a trained observer, summed up his man in a moment and acted accordingly. Come in and shut the door, he directed. No, as Mrs. Bryan sought to enter behind her husband, I wish to speak with you privately. Hop it, instructed Bryan, jerking his thumb over his shoulder, and Mrs. Bryan obediently disappeared, closing the door. Now, said Dunbar, looking the man up and down, have you been into the depot today? No, but you have heard that there's an inquiry. I've heard nothing. I've been in bed. We won't argue about that. I'll simply put a question to you. Where did you pick up the fare that you dropped at Palace Mansions at twelve o'clock last night? Palace Mansions, muttered Brian, shifting uneasily beneath the unflinching stare of the tawny eyes. What do you mean? What Palace Mansions? Don't quibble, warned Dunbar, thrusting out a finger at him. This is not a matter of a loss of license. It's a life job. Life job, whispered the man, and his weak face suddenly relaxed, so that oddly the old refinement shone out through the new vulgar veneer. Answer my question straight and square, and I'll take your word that you have not seen the inquiry, said Dunbar. Dick Hamp has done this for me, muttered Brian. He's a dirty low swine. Somebody'll do for him one night. Leave Hamper out of the question, snapped Dunbar. You put down a fare at Palace Mansions at twelve o'clock last night, for one tremendous moment, Brian hesitated, but the good that was in him, or the evil a consciousness of wrongdoing, or of retribution pending respect for the law, or fear of its might, decided his course. I did. It was a man? Again, Brian, with furtive glance, sought to test his opponent, but his opponent was too strong for him. With Dunbar's eyes upon his face, he chose not to lie. It was a woman. How was she dressed? In a fur motor coat, civet fur. The man of culture spoke in those two words, civet fur, and Dunbar nodded quickly, his eyes ablaze at the importance of the evidence. Was she alone? She was. What fare did she pay you? The meter only registered eightpence, but she gave me half a crown. Did she appear to be ill? Very ill. She wore no hat, and I supposed her to be in evening dress. She almost fell as she got out of the cab, but managed to get into the hall of Palace Mansions quickly enough, looking behind her all the time. Inspector Dunbar shot out the hypnotic finger again. She told you to wait, he asserted positively. Brian looked to right and left, up and down, thrusting his hands into his coat pockets and taking them out again to stroke his collarless neck. Then, she did yes, he admitted, but you were bribed to drive away. Don't deny it. Don't dare to trifle with me or by God. You'll spend the night in Brixton jail. It was made worth my while, muttered Brian, his voice beginning to break, to hop it. Who paid you to do it? A man who had followed all the way in a big car. That's it. Describe him. I can't. No, no. You can threaten as much as you like, but I can't describe him. I never saw his face. He stood behind me on the near side of the cab and just reached forward and pushed a flyer under my nose. Inspector Dunbar searched the speaker's face closely and concluded that he was respecting the verity. How was he dressed? In black, and that's all I can tell you about him. 
You took the money. I took the money, yes. What did he say to you? Simply, drive off. Did you take him to be an Englishman from his speech? No, he was not an Englishman. He had a foreign accent. French? German? No, said Brian, looking up and meeting the glance of the fierce eyes. Asiatic. Inspector Dunbar, closely as he held himself in hand, started slightly. Are you sure? Certainly. Before I, when I was younger, I travelled in the East, and I know the voice and intonation of the cultured Oriental. Can you place him any closer than that? No, I can't venture to do so. Brian's manner was becoming momentarily more nearly that of a gentleman. I might be leading you astray if I ventured a guess, but if you ask me to do so, I should say he was a Chinaman. A Chinaman? Dunbar's voice rose excitedly. I think so. What occurred next? I turned my cab and drove off out of the square. Did you see where the man went? I didn't. I saw nothing of him beyond his hand. And his hand. He wore a glove. And now, said Dunbar, speaking very slowly, where did you pick up your fare? In Gillingham Street, near Victoria Station. From a house. Yes, from Nurse Proctor's. Nurse Proctor's? Who is Nurse Proctor? Brian shrugged his shoulders in a nonchalant manner, which obviously belonged to an earlier phase of existence. She keeps a nursing home, he said for ladies. Do you mean a maternity home? Not exactly. At least I don't think so. Most of her clients are society ladies, who stay there periodically. What are you driving at? demanded Dunbar. I have asked you if it is a maternity home. And I have replied that it isn't. I am only giving you facts. You don't want my surmises. Who hailed you? The woman did. The woman in the fur coat. I was just passing the door very slowly when it was flung open with a bang, and she rushed out as though hell were after her. Before I had time to pull up, she threw herself into my cab and screamed, Palace Mansions, Westminster. I reached back and shut the door and drove right away. When did you see that you were followed? We were held up just outside the music hall, and looking back, I saw that my fare was dreadfully excited. It didn't take me long to find out that the cause of her excitement was a big limousine, three or four back in the block of traffic. The driver was some kind of an oriental too, although I couldn't make him out very clearly. Good, snapped Dunbar. That's important. But you saw nothing more of this car. I saw it follow me into the square. Then where did it wait? I don't know, I didn't see it again. Inspector Dunbar nodded rapidly. Have you ever driven women to or from this nurse proctor's before? On two other occasions I have driven ladies who came from there. I knew they came from there, because it got about amongst us that the tall woman in nurse's uniform who accompanied them was Nurse Proctor. You mean that you didn't take these women actually from the door of the house in Gillingham Street, but from somewhere adjacent? Yes, they never take a cab from the door. They always walk to the corner of the street with a nurse, and a porter belonging to the house brings their luggage along. The idea is secrecy, no doubt, but as I have said, the word was passed round. Did you know either of these other women? No, but they were obviously members of good society. And you drove them? One to St Pancras and one to Waterloo, said Brian, dropping back somewhat into his coarser style and permitting a slow grin to overspread his countenance. To catch trains, no doubt. Not a bit of it, to meet trains. You mean? I mean that their own private cars were waiting for them at the arrival platform as I drove them up to the departure platform, and that they simply marched through the station and pretended to have arrived by train. Inspector Dunbar took out his notebook and fountain pen and began to tap his teeth with the latter, nodding his head at the same time. You are sure of the accuracy of your last statement, he said, raising his eyes to the other. I followed one of them, was the reply, and saw her footman gravely take charge of the luggage which I had just brought from Victoria, and a pal of mine followed the other, the Waterloo one that was. Inspector Dunbar scribbled busily. Then, you have done well to make a clean breast of it, he said. Take a straight tip from me, keep off the drink. Chapter 10 The Great Understanding 
It was in the afternoon of this same day, a day so momentous in the lives of more than one of London's millions that two travellers might have been seen to descend from a first-class compartment of the Dover boat train at Charing Cross. They had been the sole occupants of the compartment, and despite the wide dissimilarity of character to be read upon their countenances, seemed to have struck up an acquaintance based upon mutual amiability and worldly common sense. The traveller first to descend and gallantly to offer his hand to his companion in order to assist her to the platform was the one whom a casual observer would first have noted. He was a man built largely, but on good lines, a man past his youth, and somewhat too fleshy. But for all his bulk, there was nothing unwieldy and nothing ungraceful in his bearing or carriage. He wore a French travelling coat, conceived in a style violently Parisian, and composed of a wonderful check calculated to have blinded any cutter in Savile Row, from beneath its gorgeous folds protruded the extremities of severely creased cashmere trousers, turned up over white spats which nestled coyly about a pair of glossy black boots. The traveller's hat was of velour, silver-grey and boasting a partridge feather thrust in its silken band. One glimpse of the outfit must have brought the entire staff of the tailor, and cut her to an untimely grave. But if ever man was born who could carry such a make-up, this traveller was he. The face was cut on massive lines, on fleshy lines, clean-shaven and inclined to pallor. The hirsute blue tinge about the jaw and lips helped to accentuate the virile strength of the long, flexible mouth, which could be humorous, which could be sorrowful, which could be grim. In the dark eyes of the man lay a wealth of experience acquired in a lifelong pilgrimage among many peoples and to many lands. His dark brows were heavily marked, and his close-cut hair was splashed with grey. Let us glance at the lady who accepted his white-gloved hand, and who sprang alertly onto the platform beside him. She was a woman bordering on the forties, with a face of masculine vigour, redeemed and effeminized by splendid hazel eyes, the kindliest imaginable. Obviously the lady was one who had never married, who despised or affected to despise members of the other sex, but who had never learned to hate them, who had never grown soured, but who found the world a garden of heedless children, of children who called for mothering. Her athletic figure was clothed in a sensible tweed travelling dress, and she wore a tweed hat pressed well onto her head, and brown boots with the flattest heels conceivable. Add to this a Scotch woolen muffler, and a pair of woolen gloves, and you have a mental picture of the second traveller, a truly incongruous companion for the first. Joining the crowd pouring in the direction of the exit gates, the two chatted together animatedly, both speaking English, and the man employing that language with a perfect ease and command of words, which nevertheless failed to disguise his French nationality. He spoke with an American accent, a phenomenon sometimes observable in one who has learned his English in Paris. The irritating formalities which beset the returning traveller, and the lady distinctly was of the readily irritated type, were smoothed away by the magic personality of her companion. Porters came at the beck of his gloved hand, guards, catching his eye, saluted and were completely his servants. Ticket inspectors yielded to him the deference ordinarily reserved for directors of the line. Outside the station, then, her luggage having been stacked upon a cab, the lady parted from her companion with assurances, which were returned, that she should hope to improve the acquaintance. The address to which the French gentleman politely requested the cabman to drive was that of a sound and old established hotel in the neighbourhood of the Strand, and at no great distance from the station. Then, having stood bareheaded until the cab turned out into the traffic stream of that busy thoroughfare, the first traveller, whose baggage consisted of a large suitcase, hailed a second cab and drove to the Hotel Astoria, the usual objective of Americans. Taking leave of him for the moment, let us follow the lady. Her arrangements were very soon made at the hotel, and having removed some of the travel stains from her person and partaken of one cup of china tea, respecting the quality whereof she delivered herself of some caustic comments, she walked down into the Strand and mounted to the top of a Victoria-bound bus. That she was not intimately acquainted with London was a fact readily observable by her fellow passengers. For as the bus went rolling westward, from the large pocket of her Norfolk jacket, 
she took out a guidebook provided with numerous maps and began composedly to consult its complexities. When the conductor came to collect her fare, she had made up her mind and was replacing the guidebook in her pocket. Put me down by the Storis, Victoria Street, conductor, she directed, and handed him a penny the correct fare. It chanced that at about the time, within a minute or so, of the American ladies leaving the hotel, and just as red rays, the harbingers of dusk, came creeping in at the latticed widow of her cosy workroom. Helen cumberly laid down her pen with a sigh. She stood up, mechanically rearranging her hair as she did so, and crossed the corridor to her bedroom, the window whereof overlooked the square. She peered down into the central garden. A common-looking man sat upon a bench, apparently watching the labours of the gardener, which consisted at the moment of the spiking of scraps of paper which disfigured the green carpet of the lawn. Helen returned to her writing table and reseated herself. Kindly twilight veiled her, and a chatty sparrow who perched upon the window ledge pretended that he had not noticed two tears which trembled, quivering, upon the girl's lashes. Almost unconsciously, for it was an established custom, she sprinkled crumbs from the tea tray beside her upon the ledge, whilst the tears dropped upon a written page, and two more appeared in turn upon her lashes. The sparrow supped enthusiastically, being joined in his repast by two talkative companions. As the last fragments dropped from the girl's white fingers, she withdrew her hand, and slowly, very slowly, her head sank down, pillowed upon her arms. For some five minutes she cried silently. The sparrows, unheeded, bade her good night, and flew to their nests in the trees of the square. Then, very resolutely, as if inspired by a settled purpose, she stood up and recrossed the corridor to her bedroom. She turned on the lamp above the dressing table and rapidly removed the traces of her tears, contemplating in dismay a redness of her pretty nose which did not prove entirely amenable to treatment with the powder puff. Finally, however, she switched off the light and, going out onto the landing, descended to the door of Henry LaRue's flat. In reply to her ring, the maid, Ferris, opened the door. She wore her hat and coat, and beside her on the floor stood a tin trunk. "'Why, Ferris?' cried Helen. "'Are you leaving?' "'I am indeed, miss,' said the girl independently. "'But why? Whatever will Mr. LaRue do? "'He'll have to do the best he can. Cook's going, too.' "'What? Cook is going?' "'I am,' announced a deep female voice, and the cook appeared beside the maid. "'But whatever?' began Helen, then realizing that she could achieve no good end by such an attitude. Tell Mr. LaRue, she instructed the maid quietly, that I wish to see him. Ferris glanced rapidly at her companion, as a man appeared on the landing, to inquire in an abysmal tone, if them boxes was ready to be took. Helen cumberly forestalled an insolent refusal which the cook, by furtive wink, counseled to the housemaid. Don't trouble, she said, with an easy dignity reminiscent of her father. I will announce myself. She passed the servants, crossed the lobby, and rapped upon the study door. Come in, said the voice of Henry LaRue. Helen opened the door. The place was in semi-darkness, objects being but dimly discernible. LaRue sat in his usual seat at the writing table. The room was in the utmost disorder, evidently having received no attention since its overhauling by the police. Helen pressed the switch, lighting the two lamps. LaRue at last seemed in his proper element. He exhibited an unhealthy pallor, and it was obvious that no razor had touched his chin for at least three days. His dark blue eyes, the eyes of a dreamer, were heavy and dull, with shadows pooled below them. A biscuit jar, a decanter and a siphon stood half buried in papers on the table. Why, Mr. LaRue, said Helen, with a deep note of sympathy in her voice, you don't mean to say. LaRue rose, forcing a smile to his haggard face. You see much too good, he said, altogether too good. I thought I should find you here, continued the girl firmly, but I did not anticipate she indicated the chaos about this, the insolence, the disgraceful, ungrateful insolence of those women. Dear, dear, dear murmured LaRue, waving his hand vaguely. Never mind, never mind. 
They, er, uh, they. I don't want them to stop, and believe me, I am a perfectly comfortable. You should not be in this room at all. In fact, you should go right away. I cannot. My wife may return at any moment. His voice shook. I am expecting her return hourly. His gaze sought the table clock, and he drew his lips very tightly together when the pitiless hands forced upon his mind the fact that the day was marching to its end. Helen turned her head aside, inhaling deeply and striving for composure. Garnum shall come down and tidy up for you, she said quietly, and you must dine with us. The outer door was noisily closed by the departing servants. You are much too good, whispered LaRue again, and the weary eyes glistened with a sudden moisture. Thank you, thank you, but uh, I could not dream of disturbing. Mr. LaRue, said Helen, with all her old firmness, Garnum is coming down immediately to put the place in order. And whilst he is doing so, you are going to prepare yourself for a decent Christian dinner. Henry LaRue rested one hand upon the table, looking down at the carpet. He had known for a long time, in a vague fashion, that he lacked something, that his success, a wholly inartistic one, had yielded him little gratification, that the comfort of his home was a purely monetary product, and not in any sense atmospheric. He had schooled himself to believe that he liked loneliness, loneliness physical and mental, and that in marrying a pretty but pleasure-loving girl, he had ensured an ideal menage. Furthermore, he honestly believed that he worshipped his wife, and with his present grief at her unaccountable silence, was mingled no atom of reproach. But latterly, he had begun to wonder, in his peculiarly indefinite way, he had begun to doubt his own philosophy. Was the void in his soul a product of thwarted ambition? For whilst he slaved scrupulously upon Martin Zeda, he loathed every deed and every word of that old man of the sea. Or could it be that his own being, his nature of Adam, lacked something which wealth, social position and Mira, his wife, could not yield to him? Now, a new tone in the voice of Helen Cumberley, a tone different from that compound of good fellowship and raillery, which he knew, a tone which had entered into it when she had exclaimed upon the state of the room, set his poor anxious heart thrumming like a lute. He felt a hot flush creeping upon him, his forehead grew damp, he feared to raise his eyes. Is that a bargain? asked Helen sweetly. Henry LaRue found a lump in his throat, but he lifted his untidy head and took the hand which the girl had extended to him. She smiled a bit unnaturally, then every tinge of colour faded from her cheeks, and Henry LaRue, unconsciously holding the white hand in a vice-like grip, looked hungrily into the eyes grown suddenly tragic, whilst into his own came the light of a great and sorrowful understanding. "'God bless you,' he said. "'I will do anything you wish.' Helen released her hand, turned, and ran from the study. Not until she was on the landing did she dare to speak." Then, Garnum shall come down immediately. Don't be late for dinner, she called, and there was a hint of laughter and of tears in her voice, of the restraint of culture struggling with rebellious womanhood. Chapter 11, presenting M. Gaston Max. Not venturing to turn on the light, not daring to look upon her own face in the mirror, Helen Cumberly sat before her dressing table, trembling wildly. She wanted to laugh and wanted to cry, but the daughter of Seton Cumberley knew what those symptoms meant and knew how to deal with them. At the end of an interval of some four or five minutes, she rang. The maid opened the door. Don't light up, Merton, she said composedly. I want you to tell Garnham to go down to Mr. LaRue's and put the place in order. Mr. LaRue is dining with us. The girl withdrew, and Helen, as the door closed, pressed the electric switch. She stared at her reflection in the mirror as if it were the face of an enemy, then, turning her head aside, sat deep in reflection, biting her lip and toying with the edge of the white doily. You little traitor, she whispered through clenched teeth. You little traitor and hypocrite sobs began to rise in her throat and fool. Five more minutes passed in a silent conflict. A knock announced the return of the maid, and the girl re-entered, placing upon the table a visiting card. Denise Ryland Atelier 4, Rue du Coq d'Oregon, Montmartre, Paris. 
Helen Cumberly started to her feet with a stifled exclamation and turned to the maid, her face, to which the colour slowly had been returning, suddenly blanched anew. Denise Ryland, she muttered, still holding the card in her hand. Why, that's Mrs. LaRue's friend, with whom she'd been staying in Paris. Whatever can it mean? Shall I show her in here, please? asked the maid. Yes, in here, replied Helen absently. And, scarcely aware that she had given instructions to that effect, she presently found herself confronted by the lady of the boat train. Miss Cumberly, said the new arrival in a pleasant American voice. Yes, I am Helen Cumberly. Oh, I am so glad to know you at last. I have often pictured you, for Mira Mrs. LaRue is always talking about you and about the glorious times you have together. I have sometimes longed to join you in beautiful Paris. How good of you to come back with her. Miss Ryland unrolled the scotch muffler from her throat, swinging her head from side to side in a sort of spuriously truculent manner, quite peculiarly her own. Her keen hazel eyes were fixed upon the face of the girl before her. Instinctively and immediately she liked Helen Cumberly, and Helen felt that this strong-looking, vaguely masculine woman was an old, intimate friend, although she had never before set eyes upon her. Hmm, said Miss Ryland. I have come from Paris, she punctuated many of her sentences with wags of the head as if carefully weighing her words, especially pause to see you pause and wag of head. I am glad to find that. You are the thoroughly sensible dot kind of girl the two had imagined from the accounts W. Which I have had of you. She seated herself in an armchair. Had of me from Mira, asked Helen. Yes, from Mrs. LaRue. How delightful it must be for you to have her with you so often. Marriage, as a rule, puts an end to that particular sort of good time, doesn't it? It does, very properly, too. No man, no man in his right senses would permit his wife to gad about in Paris with another. She presumably referred to herself, whom he had only met casually and did not like. What? Do you mean that Mr. LaRue doesn't like you? I can't believe that. Then the sooner you believe IIT, the better. It can only be that he does not know you properly. He has no wish to know Mammy properly, and I have no desire to cultivate friendship of such a silly being. Helen Cumberly was conscious that a flush was rising from her face to her brow and tingling in the very roots of her hair. She was indignant with herself and turned aside bending over her table in order to conceal this ill-timed embarrassment from her visitor. Poor Mr. LaRue, she said, speaking very rapidly, I think it awfully good of him, and sporty, to allow his wife so much liberty. Sporty, said Miss Ryland, head wagging and nostrils distended in scorn. Idiotic, I should call it. Why? Helen Cumberly, perfectly composed again, raised her clear eyes to her visitor. You seem so, thoroughly sensible, except in regard to Harry LaRue and all women, with a few exceptions, are fools where the true, true dot character of a man is concerned that I will take you right into my confidence. Her speech lost its quality of syncopation. The whole expression of her face changed, and in the hazel eyes a deep concern might be read. My dear, she stood up, crossed to Helen's side, and rested her artistic-looking hands upon the girl's shoulder. Harry LaRue stands upon the brink of a great tragedy, a life's tragedy. Helen was trembling slightly again. Oh, I know, she whispered, I know. You know? There was surprise in Miss Ryland's voice. Yes, I have seen them watch them, and I know that the police think. Police? What are you talking about, the police? Helen looked up with a troubled face. The murder! she began. Miss Ryland dropped into a chair which fortunately stood close behind her, with a face suddenly set in an expression of horror. She began to understand now a certain restraint, a certain ominous shadow, which she had perceived, or thought she had perceived, in the atmosphere of this home, and in the manner of its occupants. My dear girl, she began, and the old nervous jerky manner showed itself again, Momentarily remember that. I left Paris by.
the first train this morning, and have simply been, travelling right up to the present moment. Then you have not heard. You don't know that a murder has been committed? Murder? Not not. Not anyone connected with Mr. LaRue. No, thank God. But it was done in his flat. Miss Ryland brushed a whisk of straight hair back from her brow with a rough and ungraceful movement. My dear, she began, taking a French telegraphic form from her pocket. You see this message? It's one which reached me at an unearthly hour this morning from Harry LaRue. It was addressed to his wife at my studio. Therefore, as her friend, I opened it. Mira LaRue has actually visited me there twice since her marriage. Twice! Helen rose slowly to her feet, with horrified eyes fixed upon the speaker. Twice, I said. I have not seen her, and have rarely heard from her, for nearly twelve months now. Therefore I packed up post-haste, and here I am. I came to you because, from what little I have heard of you, and of your father, I judged you to be the right kind of friends to consult. You have not seen her for twelve months. Helen's voice was almost inaudible, and she was trembling dreadfully. That's a fact, my dear. And now, what are we going to tell Harry LaRue? It was a question, the answer to which was by no means evident at a glance. And leaving Helen Cumberly face to face with this new and horrible truth which had brought Denise Ryland Hotfoot from Paris to London, let us glance for a moment into the now familiar room of Detective Inspector Dunbar at Scotland Yard. He had returned from his interrogation of Brian, and he received the report of Sowerby respecting the late Mrs. Vernon's maid. The girl, Sergeant Sowerby declared, was innocent of complicity, and could only depose to the fact that her late mistress took very little luggage with her on the occasions of her trips to Scotland. With his notebook open before him upon the table, Dunbar was adding this slight item to his notes upon the case, when the door opened and the uniformed constable entered, saluted, and placed an envelope in the inspector's hand. From the commissioner, said Sowerby significantly. With puzzled face, Dunbar opened the envelope and withdrew the commissioner's note. It was very brief. M. Gaston Max, of the Paris police, is joining you in the Palace Mansion's murder case. You will cooperate with him from date above. Max, said Dunbar, gazing astoundedly at his subordinate. Certainly it was a name which might well account for the amazement written upon the inspector's face, for it was the name of admittedly the greatest criminal investigator in Europe. What the devil has the case to do with the French police? muttered Sowerby, his ruddy countenance exhibiting a whole history of wonderment. The constable, who had withdrawn, now reappeared, knocking deferentially upon the door, throwing it open, and announcing, Mr. Gaston Max to see Detective Inspector Dunbar. Bowing courteously upon the threshold, appeared a figure in a dazzling check, travelling coat a figure very novel, and wholly unforgettable. I am honoured to meet a distinguished London colleague, he said in perfect English, with a faint American accent. Dunbar stepped across the room with outstretched hand, and cordially shook that of the famous Frenchman. I am the more honoured, he declared, gallantly playing up to the other's courtesy. This is Detective Sergeant Sowerby, who is acting with me in the case. M. Gaston Max bowed low in acknowledgement of the introduction. It is a pleasure to meet Detective Sergeant Sowerby, he declared. These polite overtures being concluded then, and the door being closed, the three detectives stood looking at one another in momentary silence. Then Dunbar spoke with blunt directness. I am very pleased to have you with us, Mr. Max, he said, but might I ask what your presence in London means? M. Gaston Max shrugged in true Gallic fashion. It means, monsieur, he said, murder and Mr. King. Chapter 12. Mr. Giannapolis. It will prove of interest at this place to avail ourselves of an opportunity denied to the police, and to inquire into the activities of Mr. Soames, Wellum employee of Henry LaRue. Luke Soames was a man of unpleasant character, a man ever seeking advancement, advancement to what he believed to be an ideal state, viz. The possession of a competency, and to this ambition he subjugated all conflicting interests, especially the interests of others. From narrow but honest beginnings, he had developed along lines ever growing narrower, until gradually honesty became squeezed out. 
He formed the opinion that wealth was unobtainable by dint of hard work, and indeed in a man of his limited intellectual attainments, this was no more than true. At the period when he becomes of interest, he had just discovered himself a gentleman at large by reason of his dismissal from the services of a wealthy bachelor, to whose establishment in Piccadilly he had been attached in the capacity of valet. There was nothing definite against his character at this time, save that he had never remained for long in any one situation. His experience was varied, if his references were limited. He had served not only as valet, but also as chauffeur, as steward on an ocean liner, and, for a limited period, as temporary butler in an American household at Nice. Soames' banking account had increased steadily, but not at a rate commensurate with his ambitions, therefore. When entering his name and qualifications in the books of a certain exclusive employment agency in Mayfair, he determined to avail himself upon this occasion. Of his comparative independence by waiting until kindly fate should cast something really satisfactory in his path. Such an opening occurred very shortly after his first visit to the agent. He received a card instructing him to call at the office in order to meet a certain Mr. Giannapolis. Quitting his rooms in Kennington, Mr. Soames, attired in discreet black, set out to make the acquaintance of his hypothetical employer. He found Mr. Giannapolis to be a little and very swarthy man, who held his head so low as to convey the impression of having a pronounced stoop. A man whose well-cut clothes and immaculate linen could not redeem his appearance from a constitutional dirtiness. A jet-black moustache, small aquiline features, an engaging smile and very dark brown eyes, viciously crossed, made up a personality incongruous with his sheltering silk hat and calling aloud for a tarbouche and a linen suit. A shop in a bazaar, or a part in the campaign of commercial brigandage which, based in the Levant, spreads its ramifications throughout the Orient, near and far, Mr. Giannapolis had the suave speech and smiling manner. He greeted Soames not as one greets a prospective servant, but as one welcomes an esteemed acquaintance. Following a brief chat, he proposed an adjournment to a neighbouring saloon bar, and there, over cocktails, he conversed with Mr. Soames as one crook with another. Soames was charmed, fascinated, yet vaguely horrified, for this man smilingly threw off the cloak of hypocrisy from his companion's shoulders and pretended, with the skill of his race, equally to nudify his own villainy. "'My dear Mr. Soames,' he said, speaking almost perfect English, but with the sing-song intonation of the Greek, and giving all his syllables an equal value, you are the man I am looking for, and I can make your fortune. This was entirely in accordance with Mr. Soames's own views, and he nodded respectfully. I know, continued Giannapolis, proffering an excellent Egyptian cigarette, that you were cramped in your last situation, that you were misunderstood. Soames, cigarette in hand, suppressed a start, and wondered if he were turning pale. He selected a match with nervous care. The little matter of the silver spoons, continued Giannapolis, smiling fraternally, was perhaps an error of judgment. Although patting the startled Soames upon the shoulder, they were a legitimate perquisite. I am not blaming you. But it takes so long to accumulate a really useful balance in that petty way. Now he glanced cautiously about him. I can offer you a post under conditions which will place you above the consideration of silver spoons. Soames, hastily finishing his cocktail, sought for words, but Giannapolis, finishing his own, blandly ordered two more, and tapping Soames upon the knee, continued. Then that matter of the petty cash, and those trifling irregularities in the wine bill, you remember, when you were with Colonel Hewitt in Nice? Soames gripped the counter hard, staring at the newly arrived cocktail as though it were hypnotizing him. These little matters, added Giannapolis, appreciatively sipping from his own glass, which would weigh heavily against your other references in the event of their being mentioned to any prospective employer, Soames knew beyond doubt that his face was very pale indeed. These little matters, then, pursued Giannapolis, all go to prove to me that you are a man of enterprise and spirit, that you are the very man I require. 
Now I can offer you a post in the establishment of Mr. Henry LaRue, the novelist. The service will be easy. You will be required to attend to callers and to wait at table upon special occasions. There will be no valeting, and you will have undisputed charge of the pantry and wine cellar. In short, you will enjoy unusual liberty. The salary, you would say. It will be the same as that which you received from Mr. Mapleson. Soames raised his head drearily. He felt himself in the toils. He felt himself a mind man. It isn't a salary, he began, which... My dear Mr. Soames, said Ginapolis, tapping him confidentially upon the knee again. My dear Soames, it isn't the salary, I admit, which you enjoyed whilst in the services of Colonel Hewitt in a similar capacity. But this is not a large establishment, and the duties are light. Furthermore, there will be extras. Extras? Mr. Soames's eye brightened, and under the benignant influence of the cocktails his courage began to return. I do not refer, smiled Mr. Giannopoulos, to perquisites. The extras will be monetary. Another two pounds per week. Two pounds. Bringing your salary up to a nice round figure, the additional amount will be paid to you from another source. You will receive the latter payment quarterly from, from, from me, said Mr. Giannopoulos, smiling radiantly. Now I know you are going to accept that is understood between us. I will give you the address Palace Mansions, Westminster, at which you must apply, and I will tell you what little services will be required from you in return for this additional emolument. Mr. Soames hurriedly finished his second cocktail. Mr. Giannopoulos, in true sporting fashion, kept pace with him and repeated the order. You will take charge of the mail, he whispered softly one irregular eye following the movements of the barmaid, and the other fixed almost fiercely upon the face of Soames. At certain times, of which you will be notified in advance, Mrs. LaRue will pay visits to Paris. At such times, all letters addressed to her, or re-addressed to her, will not be posted. You will ring me up when such letters come into your possession. They must all come into your possession. And I will arrange to meet you, say at the corner of Victoria Street to receive them, you understand. Mr. Soames understood, and thus far found his plastic conscience marching in step with his inclinations. Then, resumed Giannopoulos, prior to her departure on these occasions, Mrs. LaRue will hand you a parcel. This also you will bring to me at the place arranged. Do you find anything onerous in these conditions? Not at all, muttered Soames a trifle unsteadily. It seems all right, the cocktails were beginning to speak now, and his voice was a duet, simply perfectly all right, all square. Good, said Mr. Giannopoulos with his radiant smile, and the gaze of his left eye, crossing that of its neighbor, observed the entrance of a stranger into the bar. He drew his stool closer and lowered his voice. Mrs. LaRue, he continued, will be in your confidence. Mr. LaRue and everyone else, everyone else, must not suspect the arrangement. Certainly, I quite understand. Mrs. LaRue will engage you this afternoon. Her husband is a mere cipher in the household, and you will commence your duties on Monday. Later in the week, Wednesday or Thursday, we will meet by appointment and discuss further details. Where can I see you? Ring up this number east and ask for Mr. King. No, don't write it down, remember it. I will come to the telephone and arrange a meeting. Shortly after this, then, the interview concluded, and later in the afternoon of that day, Mr. Soames presented himself at Palace Mansions. He was received by Mrs. LaRue, a pretty woman with a pathetically weak mouth. She had fair hair, not very abundant, and large eyes, which, since they exhibited the unusual phenomenon in a blonde of long dark lashes, Mr. Soames judged their blackness to be natural, would have been beautiful had they not been of too light a colour, too small in the pupils, and utterly expressionless. Indeed, her whole face lacked colour, as did her personality, and the exquisite tea gown which she wore conveyed that odd impression of slovenliness, which is often an indication of secret vice. She was quite young and indisputably pretty, but this malproprete, together with a certain aimlessness of manner, struck an incongruous note. 
for essentially she was of a type which for its complement needs vivacity. Mr. Soames, a man of experience, scented an intrigue and a neglectful husband. Since he was engaged on the spot without reference to the invisible LaRue, he was immediately confirmed in the latter part of his surmise. He departed well satisfied with his affairs and with the promise of the future over which Mr. Giannapolis, the cherubic, radiantly presided. Chapter 13. The Draft on Paris. For close upon a month, Soames performed the duties imposed upon him in the household of Henry LaRue. He was unable to discover, despite a careful course of inquiry from the cook and the housemaid, that Mrs. LaRue frequently absented herself. But the servants were newly engaged, for the flat in Palace Mansions had only recently been leased by the LaRue. He gathered that they had formerly lived much abroad and that their marriage had taken place in Paris. Mrs. LaRue had been to visit a friend in the French capital once, he understood, since the housemaid had been in her employ. The mistress said the housemaid did not care twopence ha'penny for her husband. She had married him for his money and for nothing else. She had had an earlier love, declared the cook, and was pining away to a mere shadow because of her painful memories. During the last six months, the period of the cook's service, Mrs. LaRue had altered out of all recognition. The cook was of opinion that she drank secretly. Of Mr. LaRue, Soames formed the poorest opinion. He counted him a spiritless being whose world was bounded by his bookshelves, and whose wife would be a fool if she did not avail herself of the liberty which his neglect invited her to enjoy. Soames felt himself, not a snake in the grass, but a benefactor, a friend in need, a champion come to the defense of an unhappy and persecuted woman. He wondered when an opportunity should arise which would enable him to commence his chivalrous operations. Almost daily he anticipated instructions to the effect that Mrs. LaRue would be leaving for Paris immediately. But the days glided by, and the weeks glided by, without anything occurring to break the monotony of the LaRue household. Mr. Soames sought an opportunity to express his respectful readiness to Mrs. LaRue, but the lady was rarely visible outside her own apartments until late in the day. When she would be engaged in preparing for the serious business of the evening, one night a dance, another a bridge party. So it went. Mr. LaRue rarely joined her upon these festive expeditions, but clung to his study like Diogenes to his tub. Great was Mr. Soames' contempt, bitter were the reproaches of the cook, dark were the predictions of the housemaid. At last, however, Soames, feeling himself neglected, seized an opportunity which offered to cement the secret bond, the too secret bond existing between himself and the mistress of the house. Meeting her one afternoon in the lobby, which she was crossing on the way from her bedroom to the drawing room, he stood aside to let her pass, whispering, At your service, whenever you are ready, madam. It was a non-committal remark, which, if she chose to keep up the comedy, he could explain away by claiming it to refer to the summoning of the car from the garage, for Mrs. LaRue was driving out that afternoon. She did not endeavor to evade the occult meaning of the words, however, in the wearily dreamy manner which, when first he had seen her, had aroused Soames' respectful interest, she raised her thin hand to her hair, slowly pressing it back from her brow, and directed her big eyes vacantly upon him. Yes, Soames, she said. Her voice had a faraway quality in keeping with the rest of her personality. Mr. King speaks well of you, but please do not refer again to she glanced in a manner at once furtive and sorrowful in the direction of the study door to the little arrangement of... She passed on with a slow gliding gait which, together with her fragility, sometimes lent her an almost phantomesque appearance. This was comforting in its degree, since it proved that the smiling Giannapolis had in no way misled him Soames. But as a man of business, Mr. Soames was not fully satisfied. He selected an evening when Mrs. LaRue was absent, and indeed she was absent almost every evening, for LaRue entertained but little. The cook and the housemaid were absent, also, therefore, to all intents and purposes, Soames had the flat to himself. Since Henry LaRue counted in that establishment, not as an entity, but rather as a necessary, if unornamental, portion of the fittings. Standing in the lobby, 
Soames raised the telephone receiver, and having paused with closed eyes preparing the exact form of words in which he should address his invisible employer, he gave the number East 28,642. Following a brief delay, Yes, came a nasal voice. Who is it? Soames, I want to speak to Mr. King. The words apparently surprised the man at the other end of the wire, for he hesitated ere inquiring, What did you say your name was? Soames, Luke Soames. Hold on. Soames, with closed eyes and holding the receiver to his ear, silently rehearsed again the exact wording of his speech. Then, Hello, came another voice. Is that Mr. Soames? Yes. Is that Mr. Giannopoulos speaking? It is, my dear Soames, replied the sing-song voice. And Soames, closing his eyes again, had before him a mental picture of the radiantly smiling Greek. Yes, my dear Soames, continued Giannopoulos, here I am. I hope you are quite well, perfectly well. I am perfectly well, thank you. But, as a man of business, it has occurred to me that failing a proper agreement, which in this case I know would be impossible, a trifling advance on the first quarters, on your salary, my dear Soames, on your salary, payment for the first quarter shall be made to you tomorrow, my dear Soames. Why ever did you not express the wish before? Certainly, certainly. Will it be sent to me? My dear fellow, how absurd you are. Can you get out tomorrow evening about nine o'clock? Yes, easily. Then I will meet you at the corner of Victoria Street, by the hotel, and hand you your first quarter's salary. Will that be satisfactory? Perfectly, said Soames, his small eyes sparkling with avarice. Most decidedly, Mr. Giannopoulos. Many thanks. And by the way, continued the other, it is rather fortunate that you rang me up this evening, because it has saved me the trouble of ringing you up. What? Soames' eyes half closed, from the bottom lids upwards, there is something. There is a trifling service which I require of you, yes, my dear Soames. Is it? We will discuss the matter tomorrow evening. Oh, it is a mere trifle. So goodbye for the present. Soames, with the fingers of his two hands interlocked before him, and his thumbs twirling rapidly around one another, stood in the lobby, gazing reflectively at the rug-strewn floor. He was working out in his mind how handsomely this first payment would show up on the welcome side of his passbook. Truly, he was fortunate in having met the generous Giannopoulos. He thought of a trifling indiscretion committed at the expense of one Mr. Mapleson, and of the wine bill of Colonel Hewitt, and he thought of the apparently clairvoyant knowledge of the Greek. A cloud momentarily came between his perceptive and the rosy horizon. But nearer to the foreground of the mental picture, uprose a left-hand page of his past book, and its tidings of great joy, written in clerkly hand, served to dispel the cloud. Soames sighed in gentle rapture, and, soft-footed, passed into his own room. Certainly his duties were neither difficult nor unpleasant. The mistress of the house lived apparently in a hazy dream world of her own, and Mr. LaRue was the ultimate expression of the non-commercial. Mr. Soames could have robbed him every day had he desired to do so, but he had refrained from availing himself even of those perquisites which he considered justly his. For it was evident to his limited intelligence that greater profit was to be gained by establishing himself in this household than by weeding out five shillings here and half a sovereign there, at the risk of untimely dismissal. Yet it was a struggle, all Mr. Soames's commercial instincts were up in arms against this voice of a greater avarice which counselled abstention. For instance, he could have added half a sovereign a week to his earnings by means of a simple arrangement with the local wine merchant. LaRue's cigars he could have sold by the hundreds, for LaRue, when a friend called, would absently open a new box, entirely forgetful of the fact that a box from which but two or at most three cigars had been taken lay already on the bureau. Mr. Soames, in order to put his theories to the test, had temporarily abstracted half a dozen such boxes from the study in the dining room and had hidden them. LaRue, finding as he supposed that he was out of cigars, had simply ordered Soames to get him some more. There are about a dozen boxes of Soames, he had said, of the same sort. 
Was ever a man of business submitted to such an ordeal? After receiving those instructions, Soames had sat for close upon an hour in his own room, contemplating the six broken boxes, containing in all some five hundred and ninety cigars, but the voice within prevailed. He must court no chance of losing his situation. Therefore, he discovered these six boxes in a cupboard, much to Henry LaRue's surprise. Then, LaRue regularly sent him to the Charing Cross branch of the London County and Suburban Bank, with open checks. Sometimes, he would be sent to pay in, at other times to withdraw, the amounts involved varying from one guinea to one hundred and fifty pounds. But, as he told himself, on almost every occasion that he went to LaRue's bank, he was deliberately throwing money away, deliberately closing his eyes to the good fortune which this careless and gullible man cast in his path. He observed a scrupulous honesty in all these dealings, with the result that the bank manager came to regard him as a valuable and trustworthy servant, and said as much to the assistant manager, expressing his wonder that LaRue's account occasioned the bank more anxiety and gave it more work than that of any other two depositors, had at last engaged a man who would keep his business affairs in order. And these were but a few of the golden apples, which Mr. Soames permitted to slip through his fingers. So steadfast was he in his belief that Giannapolis would be as good as his word, and make his fortune. LaRue employed no secretary, and his MSS were typed at his agent's office. A most slovenly man in all things, and in business matters especially, he was the despair, not only of his banker, but of his broker, he was a man who, in professional parlance, deserved to be robbed. It is improbable that he had any but the haziest ideas, at any particular time, respecting the state of his bank balance and investments. He detested the writing of business letters, and was always at great pains to avoid anything in the nature of a commercial rendezvous. He would sign any document which his lawyer or his broker cared to send him, with simple, unquestioned faith. His bank he never visited, and his appearance was entirely unfamiliar to the staff. True, the manager knew him slightly, having had two interviews with him, one when the account was opened, and the second when LaRue introduced his solicitor and broker, in order that in the future he might not be troubled in any way with business affairs. Mr. Soames perceived more and more clearly that the mild deception projected was unlikely to be discovered by its victim and at the appointed time he hastened to the corner of Victoria Street to his appointment with Giannapolis. The latter was prompt, for Soames perceived his radiant smile afar off. The saloon bar of the Red Lion was affably proposed by Mr. Giannapolis as a suitable spot to discuss the business. Soames agreed, not without certain inward qualms, for the proximity of the hostelry to New Scotland Yard was a disquieting circumstance. However, since Giannapolis affected to treat their negotiations in the light of perfectly legitimate business, he put up no protest, and presently found himself seated in a very cosy corner of the saloon bar, with a glass of whiskey and soda on a little table before him, bubbling in a manner which rendered it an agreeable and refreshing sight in the eyes of Mr. Soames. You know, said Giannapolis, the gaze of his left eye bisecting that of his right in a most bewildering manner, they call this the Tex Tabernacle. Indeed, said Soames. Without enthusiasm, I suppose some of the Scotland Yard men do drop in now and then. Beyond doubt, my dear Soames. Soames responded to his companion's radiant smile with a smile of his own, by no means so pleasant to look upon. Soames had the type of face which, in repose, might be the face of an honest man. But his smile would have led to his instant arrest on any racecourse in Europe, it was the smile of a pickpocket. Now, continued Giannapolis, here is a quarter's salary in advance. From a pocketbook, he took a little brown paper envelope, and from the brown paper envelope counted out four five-pound notes, five golden sovereigns, one half-sovereign, and ten shillings worth of silver. Soames's eyes glittered delightedly. A little informal receipt? smiled Giannapolis, raising his eyebrows satanically, here on this page of my notebook I have written, received from Mr. King for service rendered, £26, being payment in advance of amount due on 31st October 19. 
I have attached a stamp to the page, as you will see, continued Giannapolis. And here is a fountain pen. Just sign across the stamp, adding today's date. Soames complied with willing alacrity, and Giannapolis, having carefully blotted the signature, replaced the notebook in his pocket and politely acknowledged the return of the fountain pen. Soames, glancing furtively about him, replaced the money in the envelope and thrust the latter carefully into a trouser pocket. Now, resumed Giannapolis, we must not permit our affairs of business to interfere with our amusements. He stepped up to the bar and ordered two more whiskies with soda. These being sampled, business was resumed. Tomorrow, said Giannapolis, leaning forward across the table so that his face almost touched that of his companion, you will be entrusted by Mr. LaRue with a commission. Soames nodded eagerly, his eyes upon the speaker's face. You will accompany Mrs. LaRue to the bank, continued Giannapolis, in order that she may write a specimen signature in the presence of the manager. For transmission to the credit Lyonnais in Paris, Soames nearly closed his little eyes in his effort to comprehend. A draft in her favour, continued the Greek, has been purchased by Mr. LaRue's bank from the Paris bank, and on presentation of this, a checkbook will be issued to Mrs. LaRue by the Credit Lyonnais in Paris to enable her to draw at her convenience upon that establishment against the said order. Do you follow me? Soames nodded rapidly, eager to exhibit an intelligent grasp of the situation. Now Giannapolis lowered his voice impressively. No one at the Charing Cross branch of the London County and Suburban Bank has ever seen Mrs. LaRue. Oh, we have been careful of that, and we shall be careful in the future. You are known already as an accredited agent of LaRue. Therefore he bent yet closer to Soames's ear. You will direct the chauffeur to drop you, not at the strand entrance, but at the side entrance. You follow. Soames, almost holding his breath, nodded again. At the end of the court, in which the latter entrance is situated, a lady dressed in the same manner as Mrs. LaRue, this is arranged, will be waiting. Mrs. LaRue will walk straight up the court into the corridor of bank chambers by the back entrance and from thence out into the Strand. You will escort the second lady into the manager's office and she will sign Mira LaRue instead of the real Mira LaRue. Soames became aware that he was changing colour. This was a superior felony, and as such, it awed his little mind. It was tantamount to burning his boats. Missing silver spoons and cooked petty cash were trivialities usually expiable at the price of a boot-assisted dismissal. But this, you understand? Giannapolis was not smiling now. There is not the slightest danger. The signature of the lady whom you will meet will be an exact duplicate of the real one, that is, exact enough to deceive a man who is not looking for a forgery. But it would not be exact enough to deceive the French banker. He will be looking for a forgery. You follow me? The signature on the checks drawn against the credit Lyonnais will be the same as the specimen forwarded by the London County and Suburban, since they will be written by the same lady, the duplicate Mrs. LaRue. Therefore, the French bank will have no means of detecting the harmless little deception practiced upon them, and the English bank, if it should ever see those checks, will raise no question. Since the checks will have been honored by the credit Lyonnais, Soames finished his whiskey and soda at a gulp. Finally, concluded Giannapolis, you will escort the lady out by the front entrance to the Strand. She will leave you and walk in an easterly direction, making some suitable excuse if the manager should insist upon seeing her to the door, and the real Mrs. LaRue will come out by the Strand end of Bank Chambers Corridor and walk back with you around the corner to where the car will be waiting. Perfect. Quite, said Soames huskily, but when, some twenty minutes later, he returned to Palace Mansions, he was a man lost in thought, and he did not entirely regain his wanted composure, and did not entirely shake off the incubus doubt, until in his own room he had recounted the contents of the brown paper envelope. Then, it's safe enough, he muttered, and it's worth it. Thus it came about that on the following morning. LaRue called him into the study and gave him just such instructions as Giannapolis had outlined the evening before. I am too busy to go myself, Soames, said LaRue. 
and a Mrs. LaRue will shortly be paying a visit to friends in a, in Paris, so that I am opening a credit there for her. Save so much trouble and such a lot of correspondence international money orders and such worrying things. Mr. Smith, the manager, knows you, and you will take this letter of authority. The draft, I understand, has already been purchased. Mr. Soames was bursting with anxiety to learn the amount of this draft, but could find no suitable opportunity to inquire. The astonishing deception, then, was carried out without anything resembling a hitch. Mrs. LaRue went through with her part in the comedy in the dreamy manner of a somnambulist, and the duplicate Mrs. LaRue, who waited at the appointed spot, had achieved so startling a resemblance to her prototype that Mr. Soames became conscious of a craving for a peg of brandy at the moment of setting eyes upon her. However, he braced himself up and saw the business through. As was to be expected, no questions were raised and no doubts entertained. The bank manager was very courteous and very reserved, and the fictitious Mrs. LaRue equally reserved, indeed cold. She avoided raising her motor veil, and immediately the business was concluded, took her departure, Mr. Smith escorting her as far as the door. She walked away toward Fleet Street, and the respectful attendant Soames toward Charing Cross. He rejoined Mrs. LaRue at the door of bank chambers, and the two turned the corner and entered the waiting car. Soames was rather nervous, Mrs. LaRue quite apathetic. Shortly after this event, Soames learnt that the date of Mrs. LaRue's departure to Paris was definitely fixed. He received from her hands a large envelope. For Mr. King, she said in her dreamy fashion, and he noticed that she seemed to be in poorer health than usual. Her mouth twitched strangely. She was a nervous wreck. Then came her departure, attended by a certain bustle, an appointment with Mr. Giannapolis, and the delivery of the parcel into that gentleman's keeping. Mrs. LaRue was away for six days on this occasion. LaRue sent her three postcards during that time and readdressed some ten or twelve letters which arrived for her. The address in all cases was Care of Miss Denise Ryland, Atelier 4, Rue de Coq d'Or, Montmartre, Paris. East 18,642 was much in demand that week, and there were numerous meetings between Soames and Giannapolis at the corner of Victoria Street and numerous whiskies and sodas in the Red Lion, for Giannapolis persisted in his patronage of that establishment, apparently for no other reason than because it was dangerously near to Scotland Yard, and an occasional house of call for members of the Criminal Investigation Department. Thus did Mr. Soames commence his career of duplicity at the flat of Henry LaRue, and for some twelve months before the events which so dramatically interfered with the delightful scheme, he drew his double salary and performed his perfidious work with great efficiency and contentment. Mrs. LaRue paid four other visits to Paris during that time and always returned in much better spirits, although pale and somewhat haggard-looking. It fell to the lot of Soames always to meet her at Charing Cross, but never once, by look or by word, did she proffer or invite the slightest exchange of confidence. She apathetically accepted his aid in conducting this intrigue as she would have accepted his aid in putting on her opera cloak. The curious Soames had read right through the telephone directory from A to Z in quest of East, 18,642 only, to learn that no such number was published. His ingenuity not being great, he could think of no means to learn the address of the mysterious Mr. King, so keenly had he been impressed with the omniscience of that shadowy being who knew all his past that he feared to inquire of the Eastern Exchange. His banking account was growing handsomely, and above all things, he dreaded to kill the goose that laid the golden eggs. Then came the night which shattered all. Having rung up East 18,642 and made an appointment with Giannapolis in regard to some letters for Mrs. LaRue, he had been surprised, on reaching the corner of Victoria Street, to find that Giannapolis was not there. He glanced up at the face of Big Ben. Yes, for the first time during their business acquaintance, Mr. Giannapolis was late. For close upon twenty minutes, Soames waited walking slowly up and down. When, at last, coming from the direction of Westminster, 
he saw the familiar spruce figure. Eagerly, he hurried forward to meet the Greek, but Giannapolis, to the horror and amazement of Soames, affected not to know him. He stepped aside to avoid the stupefied butler and passed. But in passing, he hissed these words at Soames. Follow to Victoria Street Post Office. Pretend to post letters at next box to me and put them in my hand. He was gone. Soames, dazed at this new state of affairs, followed him at a discreet distance. Giannapolis ran up the post office steps briskly, and Soames immediately afterwards ascended also furtively. Giannapolis was taking out a number of letters from his pocket. Soames walked across to the country box on his right and affected to scrutinize the addresses on the envelopes of Mrs. LaRue's correspondence. Giannapolis, on the pretense of posting a country letter, reached out and snatched the correspondence from Soames's hand. The gaze of his left eye crookedly sought the face of the butler. Go home, whispered Giannapolis. Be cautious. Chapter 14 East, 18,642. In a pitiable state of mind, Soames walked away from the post office. Giannapolis had hurried off in the direction of Victoria Station. Something was wrong. Some part of the machine, of the dimly divined machine whereof he formed a cog, was out of gear. Since the very nature of this machine, its construction and purpose, alike was unknown to Soames, he had no basis upon which to erect surmises for good or ill. His timid inquiries into the identity of East 18,642 had begun and terminated with his laboured perusal of the telephone book, a profitless task which had occupied him for the greater part of an evening. The name, Giannapolis, did not appear at all, whereas there proved to be some 290 kings. But, oddly, only four of these were on the Eastern Exchange. One was a veterinary surgeon, one a boat builder, and a third a teacher of dancing. The fourth, an engineer, seemed impossible to Soames although his published number was not 18,642, but a brief, a very brief conversation, convinced the butler that this was not his man. He had been away from the flat for over an hour, and he doubted if even the lax sense of discipline possessed by Mr. LaRue would enable that gentleman to overlook this irregularity. Soames had a key of the outer door, and he built his hopes upon the possibility that LaRue had not noticed his absence and would not hear his return. He opened the door very quietly, but had scarcely set his foot in the lobby ere the dreadful, unforgettable scene met his gaze. For more years than he could remember, he had lived in dread of the law, and, in Luke Soames's philosophy, the words Satan and detective were interchangeable. Now, before his eyes, was a palpable, unmistakable police officer, and on the floor, just one glimpse he permitted himself, and in a voice that seemed to reach him from a vast distance. The detective was addressing him, slinking to his room, with his craven heart missing every fourth beat, and his mind in chaos. Soames sank down upon the bed, locked his hands together, and hugged them convulsively between his knees. It was come. He had overstepped that almost invisible boundary line which divides indiscretion from crime. He knew now that the voice within him the voice which had warned him against Giannapolis and against becoming involved in what dimly he had perceived to be an elaborate scheme, had been. Not the voice of cowardice, as he had supposed, but that of prudence. And it was too late. The dead woman, he told himself, he had been unable to see her very clearly, undoubtedly was Mrs. LaRue. What in God's name had happened? Probably her husband had killed her. Which meant, it meant that proofs, Proofs were come into his possession, and who should be involved, entangled in the meshes of this fallen conspiracy, but himself, Luke Soames? As must be abundantly evident, Soames was not a criminal of the daring type. He did not believe in reaching out for anything until he was well assured that he could, if necessary, draw back his hand. This last venture, this regrettable venture, this ruinous venture, had been a mistake. He had entered into it under the glamour of Giannapolis's personality. Of what use, now, to him was his swelling bank balance? But in justice to the mental capacity of Soames, it must be admitted 
that he had not entirely overlooked such a possibility as this. He had simply refrained, for the good of his health, from contemplating it. Long before, he had observed with interest that, should an emergency arise such as a fire, a means of egress had been placed by the kindly architect adjacent to his bedroom window. Thus, his departure on the night of the murder was not the fruit of a sudden scheme, but of one well matured. Closing and locking his bedroom door, Soames threw out upon the bed the entire contents of his trunk, selected those things which he considered indispensable and those which might constitute clues. He hastily packed his grip and, with a last glance about the room and some seconds of breathless listening at the door, he attached to the handle a long piece of cord, which at some time had been tied about his trunk, and, gently opening the window, lowered the grip into the courtyard beneath. The light he had already extinguished, and with the conviction dwelling in his bosom that in some way he was become accessory to a murder, that he was a man shortly to be pursued by the police of the civilized world. He descended the skeleton lift shaft, picked up his grip, and passed out under the archway into the lane at the back of Palace Mansions and St. Andrew's Mansions. He did not proceed in the direction which would have brought him out into the square, but elected to emerge through the other end. At exactly the moment that Inspector Dunbar rushed into his vacated room, Mr. Soames, grip in hand, was mounting to the top of a southward-bound bus at the corner of Parliament Street. He was conscious of a need for reflection. He longed to sit in some secluded spot in order to think. At present, his brain was a mere whirligig, and all things about him seemingly danced to the same tune. Stationary objects were become unstable in the eyes of Soames, and the solid earth, burst free of its moorings, no longer afforded him a safe foothold. There was a humming in his ears, and a mist floated before his eyes. By the time that the motor bus was come to the south side of the bridge, Soames had succeeded in slowing down his mental roundabout in some degree, and now he began grasping at the flying ideas which the diminishing violence of his brainstorm enabled him vaguely to perceive. The first fruits of his reflections were bitter. He viewed the events of the night in truer focus. He saw that by his flight he had sealed his fate, had voluntarily outlawed himself. It became frightfully evident to him that he dared not seek to draw from his bank, that he dared not touch even his modest post office account. With the exception of some twenty-five shillings in his pocket, he was penniless. How could he hope to fly the country, or even to hide himself without money? He glanced suspiciously about the bus, for he perceived that an old instinct had prompted him to mount one which passed the oval a former point of debarkation when he lived in rooms near Kennington Park. Someone might recognize him. Furtively he scanned his fellow passengers, but perceived no acquaintance. What should he do? Where should he go? It was a desperate situation. The inspector, who had cared to study that furtive, isolated figure, could not have failed to mark it for that of a hunted man. At Kennington Gate, the bus made a halt. Soames glanced at the clock on the corner. It was close upon 1 a.m. Where in heaven's name should he go? What a fool he had been to come to this district where he was known. Stay. There was one man in London, surely, who must be almost as keenly interested in the fate of Luke Soames as Luke Soames himself. Giannapolis. Soames sprang up and hurried off the bus. No public telephone box would be available at that hour, but dire need spurred his slow mind and also lent him assurance. He entered the office of the taxicab depot on the next corner, and from the man whom he found in charge, solicited and obtained the favor of using the telephone. Lifting the receiver, he asked for East 18,642. The seconds that elapsed now were as hours of deathly suspense to the man at the telephone. If the number should be engaged, if the exchange could get no reply. Hello, said a nasal voice. Who is it? It is Soames, and I want to speak to Mr. King. He lowered his tone as much as possible, almost whispering his own name. He knew the voice which had answered him. It was the same that he always heard when ringing up East 18,642. But would Giannapolis come to the telephone? Suddenly, Is that Soames? spoke the sing-song voice of the Greek. Yes, yes. Where are you? At Kennington. 
Are they following you? No, I don't think so. At least, what am I to do? Where am I to go? Get to Globe Road, near Stratford Bridge, east without delay. But whatever you do, see that you are not followed. Globe Road is the turning immediately beyond the railway station. It is not too late, perhaps, to get a bus or tram for some part of the way at any rate. But even if the last is gone, don't take a cab, walk. When you get to Globe Road, pass down on the left-hand side, and if necessary, right to the end. Make sure you are not followed, then walk back again. You will receive a signal from an open door. Come right in. Goodbye. Soames replaced the receiver on the hook, uttering a long-drawn sigh of relief. The arbiter of his fortunes had not failed him. Thank you very much, he said to the man in charge of the office, who had been bending over his books and apparently taking not the slightest interest in the telephone conversation. Soames placed twopence, the price of the call, on the desk. Good night. Good night. He hastened out of the gate and across the road. An electric tram car which would bear him as far as the elephant and castle was on the point of starting from the corner. Grip in hand, Soames boarded the car and mounted to the top deck. He was in some doubt respecting his mode of travel from the next point onward, but the night was fine, even if he had to walk, and his reviving spirits would cheer him with visions of a golden future. His money, that indeed was a bitter draught, the loss of his hardly earned savings. But he was now established linked by a common secret in partnership with Giannopoulos. He was one of that mysterious, obviously wealthy group which arranged drafts on Paris, which could afford to pay him some hundreds of pounds per annum for such a trifling service as juggling the mail. Mr. King, if Giannopoulos were only the servant, what a magnificent man of business must be hidden beneath the cognomen Mr. King and he was about to meet that lord of mystery. Fear and curiosity were oddly blended in the anticipation. By great good fortune, Soames arrived at the Elephant and Castle in time to catch an eastward-bound motor, bus a bus which would actually carry him to the end of Globe Road. He took his seat on top, and with greater composure than he had known since his dramatic meeting with Giannopoulos in Victoria Street, lighted one of Mr. LaRue's cabanas, with which he invariably kept his case filled and settled down to think about the future. His reflections served apparently to shorten the journey, and Soames found himself proceeding along Globe Road, a dark and uninviting highway, almost before he realised that London Bridge had been traversed. It was now long past one o'clock, and that part of the East End showed dreary and deserted. Public houses had long since ejected their late guests, and even those argumentative groups which, after closing time, linger on the pavements within the Eau de Bacchanalian, were dispersed. The jauntiness was gone now from Soames' manner, and aware of a marked internal depression, he passed furtively along the pavement with its long, shadowy reaches between the islands of light formed by the street lamps. From patch to patch he passed, and each successive lamp that looked down upon him found him more furtive, more bent in his carriage. Not a shop nor a house exhibited any light. Sleeping Globe Road, east, served to extinguish the last poor spark of courage within Soames' bosom. He came to the extreme end of the road without having perceived a beckoning hand, without having detected a sound to reveal that his advent was observed. In the shadow of a wall he stopped, resting his grip upon the pavement and looking back upon his tracks. No living thing moved from end to end of Globe Road. Shivering slightly, Soames picked up the bag and began to walk back. Less than halfway along, an icy chill entered into his veins and his nerves quivered like piano wires, for a soft crying of his name came, eerie through the silence, and terrified the hearer. Soames! Soames! Soames stopped dead, breathing very rapidly and looking about him right and left. He could hear the muted pulse of sleeping London. Then, in the dark doorway of the house before which he stood, he perceived, dimly, a motionless figure. His first sensation was not of relief, but of fear. The figure raised a beckoning hand. Soames, conscious that his course was set and that he must navigate it accordingly, opened the iron gate, passed up the path, and entered the house to which he thus had been summoned. 
he found himself surrounded by absolute darkness, and the door was closed behind him. Straight ahead, Soames, said the familiar voice of Giannapolis out of the darkness. Soames, with a gasp of relief, staggered on. A hand rested upon his shoulder, and he was guided into a room on the right of the passage. Then an electric lamp was lighted, and he found himself confronting the Greek. But Giannapolis was no longer radiant. All the innate evil of the man shone out through the smirking mask. Sit down, Soames, he directed. Soames, placing his bag upon the floor, seated himself in a cane armchair. The room was cheaply furnished as an office, with a roll-top desk, a revolving chair, and a filing cabinet. On a side table stood a typewriter, and about the room were several other chairs whilst the floor was covered with cheap linoleum. Giannapolis sat in the revolving chair, staring at the lowered blinds of the window and brushing up the points of his black moustache. With a fine white silk handkerchief, Soames gently wiped the perspiration from his forehead and from the lining of his hatband. Giannapolis began abruptly, There has been an accident. He continued to brush his moustache with increasing rapidity. Tell me all that took place after you left the post office. Soames nervously related his painful experiences of the evening, whilst Giannapolis drilled his moustache to a satanic angle. The story being concluded, Whatever has happened, groaned Soames, and what am I to do? What you are to do, replied Giannapolis, will be arranged, my dear Soames, by Mr. King. Where you are to go is a problem shortly settled. You are to go nowhere. You are to stay here. Here. Soames gazed drearily about the room. Not exactly here. This is merely the office, but at, at our establishment proper in Limehouse. Limehouse. Certainly. Although you seem to be unaware of the fact, Soames, there are some charming resorts in Limehouse, and your duties, for the present, will confine you to one of them. But, but, hesitated Soames, the police, unless my information is at fault, said Giannapolis, the police have no greater chance of paying us a visit now than they had formerly. But Mrs. LaRue, Mrs. LaRue, Giannapolis twirled around in the chair, his eyes squinting demoniacally, Mrs. LaRue. She, she, what about Mrs. LaRue? Isn't she dead? Dead, Mrs. LaRue. You are laboring under a strange delusion, Soames. The lady whom you saw was not Mrs. LaRue. Soames' brain began to fail him again. Then who, he began. That doesn't concern you in the least, Soames. But what does concern you is this. Your connection, and my connection, with the matter cannot possibly be established by the police. The incident is regrettable, but the emergency was dealt with in time. It represents a serious deficit, unfortunately, and your own usefulness, for the moment, becomes nil. But we shall have to look after you, I suppose, and hope for better things in the future. He took up the telephone. East 39,951, he said, while Soames listened attentively. Then, is that Khan's Sir Concessions, he asked. Yes, good. Tell said to bring the car past the end of the road at a quarter to two, and that's all. He hung up the receiver. Now, my dear Soames, he said with a faint return to his old manner, you are about to enter upon new duties. I will make your position clear to you. Whilst you do your work and keep yourself to yourself, you are in no danger. But one indiscretion, just one apart from what it may mean for others, will mean for you immediate arrest as accessory to a murder. Soames shuddered coldly. You can rely upon me, Mr. Giannapolis, he protested, to do absolutely what you wish. Absolutely. I am a ruined man, and I know it. I know it. My only hope is that you will give me a chance. You shall have every chance, Soames, replied Giannapolis, very chance. Chapter 15 Cave of the Golden Dragon when the car stopped at the end of a short drive, Soames had not the slightest idea of his whereabouts. The blinds at the window of the limousine had been lowered during the whole journey, and now he descended from the step of the car on to the step of a doorway. He was in some kind of roofed-in courtyard, only illuminated by the headlamps of the car. Mr. Giannapolis pushed him forward, 
and, as the door was closed, he heard the gear of the car reversed. Then silence fell. My grip, he began nervously. It will be placed in your room, Soames. The voice of the Greek answered him from the darkness. Guided by the hand of Giannapolis, he passed on and descended a flight of stone steps. Ahead of him a light shone out beneath the door, and as he stumbled on the steps, the door's thrown suddenly open. He found himself looking into a long, narrow apartment. He pulled up short with a smothered, gasping cry. It was a cavern, but a cavern the like of which he had never seen, never imagined. The walls had the appearance of being rough-hewn from virgin rock, from black rock, from rock black as the rocks of shallow black as the gates of Erebus. Placed at regular intervals along the frowning walls, to right and left, were spiral, slender pillars, gilded and gleaming. They supported an archwork of fancifully carven wood, which curved gently outward to the center of the ceiling, forming, by conjunction with a similar, opposite curve, a pointed arch. In niches of the wall were a number of grotesque Chinese idols. The floor was jet black and polished like ebony. Several tiger-skin rugs were strewn about it. But dominating the strange place, in the center of the floor stood an ivory pedestal, supporting a golden dragon of exquisite workmanship. And before it, as before a shrine, an enormous Chinese vase was placed, of the hue at its base, of deepest violet, fading upward, through all the shades of rose pink seen in an Egyptian sunset, to a tint more elusive than a maiden's blush. It contained a mass of exotic poppies of every shade conceivable, from purple so dark as to seem black, to poppies of the whiteness of snow. Just within the door, and immediately in front of Soames, stood a slim man of about his own height, dressed with great nicety in a perfectly fitting morning coat, his well-cut cashmere trousers falling accurately over glossy boots having grey suede uppers. His linen was immaculate, and he wore a fine pearl in his black poplin cravat. Between two yellow fingers smouldered a cigarette. Soames unconsciously clenched his fists. This slim man embodied the very spirit of the outre. The fantastic surroundings melted from the ken of Soames, and he seemed to stand in a shadow world, alone with an incarnate shadow. For this was a Chinaman. His jet-black lusterless hair was not shaven in the national manner, but worn long and brushed back from his slanting brow with no parting, so that it fell about his white collar behind, lankly. He wore gold-rimmed spectacles, which magnified his oblique eyes, and lent him a terrifying beetle-like appearance. His Mephistophelian eyebrows were raised interrogatively, and he was smiling so as to exhibit a row of uneven yellow teeth. Soames, his amazement giving place to reasonless terror, fell back a step into the arms of Giannapolis. This is our friend from Palace Mansions, said the Greek. He squeezed Soames's arm reassuringly. Your new principal, Soames, Mr. Hopin, from whom you will take your instructions. I have these instructions for Mr. Soames, said Hopin, in a metallic, monotonous voice. He gave to R half the value of W, with a hint of the presence of L. He will remain here as valet, until the search for him becomes less rigorous. Soames, scarce believing that he was awake, made no reply. He found himself unable to meet the glittering eyes of the Chinaman. He glanced furtively about the room, prepared at any moment to wake up from what seemed to him an absurd, a ghostly dream. Said will change his appearance, continued Ho Pin smoothly, so that he will not readily be recognized. Said will come now. Hopin clapped his hands three times. The door at the end of the room immediately opened, and a thick-set man of a pronounced Arabian type entered. He wore a chauffeur's livery of dark blue, and Soames recognized him for the man who had driven the car. Said, said Hopin very deliberately, turning to face the new arrival, Ahu hina Lucas Effendi, mister. Lucas, wadi el shenta ila beta oda. Fimt, said bowed his head, Fahim Effendi, he muttered rapidly, Mafish. Again said bowed his head, then, glancing at Soames, Tala Weyaya, he said. 
Soames, looking helplessly at Ginapolis, who merely pointed to the door followed said from the room, he was conducted along a wide passage, thickly carpeted, and having its walls covered with a kind of matting kept in place by strips of bamboo. Its roof was similarly concealed. A door near to the end, and on the right, proved to open into a square room quite simply furnished in the manner of a bed-sitting room. A little bathroom opened out of it in one corner. The walls were distempered white, and there was no window. Light was furnished by an electric lamp hanging from the centre of the ceiling. Soames, glancing at his bag, which said had just placed beside the white enamelled bedstead, turned to his impassive guide. This is a funny go, he began with forced geniality. Am I to live here? Malesh, muttered said Malesh. He indicated by gestures that Soames should remove his collar. He was markedly unemotional. He crossed to the bathroom and could be heard filling the hand basin with water. Cursey, he called from within. Soames, seriously doubting his own sanity, and so obsessed with a sense of the unreal that his senses were benumbed, began to take off his collar. He could not feel the contact of his fingers with his neck in the act. Collarless, he entered the little bathroom. Cursey, repeated, said then. Ah, Ananesit Malesh, said, while Soames, docile in his stupor, watched him went back, picked up the solitary cane chair which the apartment boasted, and brought it into the bathroom. Soames perceived that he was to be treated to something in the nature of a shampoo, for said had ranged a number of bottles, a cake of soap, and several towels along a shelf over the bath. In a curious state of passivity, Soames submitted to the operation. His hair was vigorously toweled, then fanned in the most approved fashion, but this was no more than the beginning of the operation. As he leaned back in the chair, "'Am I dreaming?' he said aloud, What's all this about? Uskut, muttered said Uskut. Soames, at no time an aggressive character, resigned himself to the incredible. Some lotion, which tingled slightly upon the scalp, was next applied by said from a long-necked bottle. Then fresh water having been poured into the basin, a dark purple liquid was added, and Soames's head dipped therein by the operating eastern. This time no rubbing followed, but after some minutes of vigorous fanning, he was thrust back into the chair, and a dry towel tucked firmly into his collar band. He anticipated that he was about to be shaved, and in this was not disappointed. Said, filling a shaving mug from the hot water tap, lathered Soames' chin and the abbreviated whiskers upon which he had prided himself. Then the razor was skillfully handled, and Soames' face shaved until his chin was as smooth as satin. Next, a dark brown solution was rubbed over the skin, and even upon his forehead and right into the roots of the hair, upon his throat, his ears, and the back of his neck. He was now past the putting of questions or the raising of protest. He was as clay in the hands of the silent Oriental. Having fanned his wet face again for some time, said, breaking the long silence, muttered, Ikfiliun. Soames stared, said indicated by pantomime, that he desired him to close his eyes, and Soames obeyed mechanically. Thereupon, the Oriental busied himself with the ex-butler's not very abundant lashes for five minutes or more. Then the busy fingers were at work with his inadequate eyebrows. Finally, Kalas, muttered said, tapping him on the shoulder. Soames wearily opened his eyes, wondering if his strange martyrdom were nearly at its end. He discovered his hair to be still rather damp, but since it was sparse, it was rapidly drying. His eyes smarted painfully. Removing all trace of his operations, said with no word of farewell, took up his towels, bottles, and other paraphernalia, and departed. Soames watched the retreating figure crossing the outer room, but did not rise from the chair until the door had closed behind said. Then, feeling strangely like a man who has drunk too heavily, he stood up and walked into the bedroom. There was a small shaving glass upon the chest of drawers, and to this he advanced, filled with the wildest apprehensions. One glance he ventured, and started back with a groan. His apprehensions had fallen short of the reality. With one hand clutching the bedrail, he stood there swaying from side to side, and striving to screw up his courage to the point whereat he might venture upon a second glance in the mirror. At last he succeeded, 
looking long and pitifully. Oh, Lord, he groaned, what a guy. Beyond doubt he was strangely changed. By nature, Luke Soames had hair of a sandy color. Now it was of so dark a brown as to seem black in the lamplight. His thin eyebrows and scanty lashes were naturally almost colorless, but they were become those of a pronounced brunette. He was of pale complexion, but tonight had the face of a mulatto, or of one long in tropical regions. In short, he was another man, a man whom he detested at first sight. This was the price, or perhaps only part of the price, of his indiscretion. Mr. Soames was become Mr. Lucas. Clutching the top of the chest of drawers with both hands, he glared at his own reflection dazedly. In that pose he was interrupted, said silently opening the door behind him, muttered, Ta'ala wayaya. Soames whirled around in a sudden panic, his heart leaping madly. The immobile brown face peered in at the door. Ta'ala wayaya, repeated said, his face expressionless as a mask. He pointed along the corridor. Hope in Effendi, he explained. Soames, raising his hands to his collarless neck, made a swallowing noise and would have spoken, but Ta'ala wayaya, reiterated the Oriental. Soames hesitated no more. Re-entering the corridor with its straw-matting walls, he made a curious discovery. Away to the left it terminated in a blank, matting-covered wall. There was no indication of the door by which he had entered it. Glancing hurriedly to the right, he failed also to perceive any door there. The bespectacled Hopin stood halfway along the passage, awaiting him. Following said in that direction, Soames was greeted with the announcement, Mr. King will see you. The words taught Soames that his capacity for emotion was by no means exhausted. His endless conjectures respecting the mysterious Mr. King were at last to be replaced by facts. He was to see him, to speak with him. He knew now that it was a fearful privilege which gladly he would have denied himself. Hopin opened a door almost immediately behind him, a door the existence of which had not hitherto been evident to Soames. Beyond was a dark passage. You will follow me closely, said Ho Pin with one of his piercing glances. Soames, finding his legs none too steady, entered the passage behind Ho Pin. As he did so, the door was closed by said, and he found himself in absolute darkness. Keep close behind me, directed the metallic voice. Soames could not see the speaker, since no ray of light penetrated into the passage. He stretched out a groping hand, and although he was conscious of an odd revulsion, touched the shoulder of the man in front of him and maintained that unpleasant contact whilst they walked on and on through, apparently. Endless passages, extensive as a catacomb. Many corners they turned, they turned to the right, they turned to the left. Soames was hopelessly bewildered. Then suddenly, Hopin stopped. Stand still, he said. Soames became vaguely aware that a door was being closed somewhere near to him. A lamp lighted up directly over his head. He found himself in a small library. Its four walls were covered with b-book shelves from floor to ceiling, and the shelves were packed to overflowing with books in most unusual and bizarre bindings. A red carpet was on the floor, and a red shaded lamp hung from the ceiling, which was conventionally whitewashed. Although there was no fireplace, the room was immoderately hot and heavy with the perfume of roses. On three little tables were great bowls filled with roses, and there were other bowls containing roses in gaps between the books on the open shelves. A tall screen of beautifully carved sandalwood masked one corner of the room, but beyond it protruded the end of a heavy writing table upon which lay some loose papers, and standing amid them an enormous silver rose bowl, brimming with sulphur-colored blooms. Soames, obeying a primary instinct, turned, as the light leaped into being, to seek the door by which he had entered. As he did so, the former doubts of his own sanity returned with renewed vigor. The book-lined wall behind him was unbroken by any opening. Slowly, as a man awaking from a stupor, Soames gazed around the library. It contained no door. He rested his hand upon one of the shelves and closed his eyes. Beyond doubt he was going mad. The tragic events of that night had proved too much for him. He had never disguised from himself the fact that his mental capacity was not of the greatest. 
He was assured now that his brain had lost its balance shortly after his flight from Palace Mansions and that the events of the past two hours had been phantasmal. He would presently return to sanity, or, blasphemously, he dared to petition heaven that he would and find himself, perhaps in the hands of the police. Oh, God! He groaned. Oh, God! He opened his eyes. A woman stood before the sandalwood screen. She had the pallidly dusky skin of a Eurasian, but by virtue of nature or artifice, her cheeks wore a peach-like bloom. Her features were flawless in their chiseling, save for the slightly distended nostrils, and her black eyes were magnificent. She was divinely petite, slender and girlish, but there was that in the lines of her figure, so seductively defined by her clinging Chinese dress, in the poise of her small head with the blush rose nestling amid the black hair above all in the smile of her full red lips, which discounted the youth of her body, which whispered, Mine is a soul old in strange sins, a soul for whom dead Alexandria had no secrets, that learnt nothing of Athenian ties and might have tutored Messalina. In her fanciful robe of old gold, with her tiny feet shod in ridiculously small gilt slippers, she stood by the screen watching the stupefied man, an exquisite, fragrantly youthful casket of ancient, unnameable evils. Good evening, Soames, she said, stumbling quaintly with her English, but speaking in a voice musical as a silver bell. You will here be known as Lucas, Mr. King. He wishing me to say that you to receive two pounds at each week. Soames, glassy-eyed, stood watching her. A horror, the horror of insanity, had descended upon him a clammy, rose-scented mantle. The room, the incredible book-lined room, was a red blur surrounding the black, taunting eyes of the Eurasian. Everything was out of focus, past, present and future, were merged into a red, rose-haunted nothingness. "'You will attend to Block A,' resumed the girl, pointing at him with a little fan. "'You will also attend to the gentleman,' she laughed softly, revealing tiny white teeth, then paused, head tilted coquettishly, and appeared to be listening to someone's conversation, to the words of some person seated behind the screen. This fact broke in upon Soames' disordered mind and confirmed him in his opinion that he was a man demented. For only one slight sound broke the silence of the room. The red carpet below the little tables was littered with rose petals, and in the superheated atmosphere... Other petals kept falling softly with a gentle rustling. Just that sound there was, and no other. Then, Mr. King are wishing to point out to you, said the girl, that he hold receipts of you which bind you to him. So you will be free man, and have liberty to go out sometimes for your own business. Mr. King, he wishing to hear you say you thinking to agree with the conditions and be satisfied. She ceased speaking, but continued to smile, and so complete was the stillness that Soames, whose sense of hearing had become nervously stimulated, heard a solitary rose petal fall upon the corner of the writing table. I agree, he whispered huskily, and I am satisfied. He looked at the carven screen as a lost soul might look at the gate of Hades. He felt now that if a sound should come from beyond it, he would shriek out, he would stop up his ears, that if the figure of the unseen should become visible, he must die at the first glimpse of it. The little brown girl was repeating the uncanny business of listening to that voice of silence, and Soames knew that he could not sustain his part in this eerie comedy for another half minute without breaking out into hysterical laughter. Then, Mr. King, he releasing you for tonight, announced the silver bell voice. The light went out. Soames uttered a groan of terror, followed by a short, bubbling laugh, but was seized firmly by the arm and led on into the blackness on through the solid, book-laden walls, presumably, and on and on, along those interminable passages by which he had come. Here the air was cooler, and the odour of roses no longer perceptible, no longer stifling him, no longer assailing his nostrils, not as an odour of sweetness, but as a perfume utterly damnable and unholy. With his knees trembling at every step, he marched on, firmly supported by his unseen companion. Stop! 
directed a metallic, guttural voice. Soames pulled up and leaned weakly against the wall. He heard the clap of hands close behind him, and a door opened within twelve inches of the spot whereat he stood. He tottered out into the matting-lined corridor from which he had started upon that nightmare journey. Ho-Pin appeared at his elbow, but no door appeared behind Ho-Pin. This is your room, said the Chinaman, revealing his yellow teeth in a mirthless smile. He walked across the corridor, threw open a door, a real palpable door, and there was Soames' little white room. Soames staggered across, for it seemed a veritable haven of refuge entered, and dropped upon the bed. He seemed to see the rose petals fall, fall, falling in that red room in the labyrinth, the room that had no door. He seemed to see the laughing eyes of the beautiful Eurasian. Good night, came the metallic voice of Ho Pin. The light in the corridor went out. Chapter 16, Ho Pin's Catacombs. The newly created Mr. Lucas entered upon a sort of caveman existence in this fantastic abode, where night was day and day was night, where the sun never shone. He was awakened on the first morning of his sojourn in the establishment of Ho Pin by the loud ringing of an electric bell immediately beside his bed. He sprang upright with a catching of the breath, peering about him at the unfamiliar surroundings and wondering, in the hazy manner of a sleeper newly awakened, where he was and how come there. He was fully dressed, and his strapped-up grip lay beside him on the floor, for he had not dared to remove his clothes, had not dared to seek slumber after that terrifying interview with Mr. King. But outraged nature had prevailed, and sleep had come unbeckoned unbidden. The electric light was still burning in the room as he had left it and as he sat up looking about him. A purring whistle drew his attention to a speaking tube which protruded below the bell. Soames rolled from the bed, head throbbing and an acrid taste in his mouth, and spoke into the tube, Hullo! You will prepare for your duties, came the metallic gutturals of Hope in. Breakfast will be brought to you in a quarter of an hour. He made no reply, but stood looking about him dully. It had not been a dream then, nor was he mad. It was a horrible reality, here, in London, in modern, civilised London. He was actually buried in some incredible catacomb. Somewhere near to him, very near to him, was the Cave of the Golden Dragon, and also adjacent, terrifying thought, was the doorless library, the rose-scented haunt where the beautiful Eurasian spoke oracularly. The responses of Mr. King. Soames could not understand it all. He felt that such things could not be, that there must exist an explanation of those seeming impossibilities other than that they actually existed. But the instructions were veritable enough and would not be denied. Rapidly he began to unpack his grip. His watch had stopped, since he had neglected to wind it, and he hurried with his toilet, fearful of incurring the anger of hope in of Hopin the Beatlesque. He observed, with passive interest, that the operation of shaving did not appreciably lighten the stain upon his skin, and by the time that he was shaved, he had begun to know the dark-haired, yellow-faced man grimacing in the mirror for himself, but he was far from being reconciled to his new appearance. Said peeped in at the door. He no longer wore his chauffeur's livery, but was arrayed in a white linen robe, red-sashed, and wore loose red slippers, a tarbouche perched upon his shaven skull. Pushing the door widely open, he entered with a tray upon which was spread a substantial breakfast. Hurry up, he muttered as one word, wherewith he departed again. Soames seated himself at the little table upon which the tray rested, and endeavoured to eat. His usual appetite had departed with his identity, Mr. Lucas was a poor, twitching being of raw nerves and internal qualms. He emptied the coffee pot, however, and smoked a cigarette which he found in his case. Said reappeared. Ta'ala, he directed. Soames, having learnt that that term was evidently intended as an invitation to follow, said, rose and followed, dumbly. He was conducted along the matting-lined corridor to the left, and now, where formerly he had seen a blank wall, he saw an open door. Passing this, he discovered himself in the cave of the Golden Dragon. Hopin, dressed in a perfectly fitting morning coat and its usual accompaniments, received him with a mirthless smile. Good morning, 
he said. I trust your breakfast was satisfactory? Quite, sir, replied Soames mechanically, and as he might have replied to Mr. LaRue. Said we'll show you to a room, continued Hopin, where you will find a gentleman awaiting you. You will valet him and perform any other services which he may require of you. When he departs, you will clean the room and adjoining bathroom and put it into thorough rough order for an incoming tenant. In short, your duties in this respect will be identical to those which formerly you performed at sea. There is one important difference. Your name is Lucas, and you will answer no questions. The metallic voice seemed to reach Soames's comprehension from some place other than the room of the Golden Dragon, from a great distance or as though he were fastened up in a box and were being addressed by someone outside it. Yes, sir, he replied. Said opened the yellow door upon the right of the room, and Soames followed him into another of the matting-lined corridors. This one running right and left and parallel with the wall of the apartment which he had just quitted. Six doors opened out of this corridor, four of them upon the side opposite to that by which he had entered, and one at either end. These doors were not readily to be detected, and the wall, at first glance, presented an unbroken appearance. But from experience, he had learned that where the strips of bamboo which overlay the straw matting formed a rectangular panel, there was a door, and by the light of the electric lamp hung in the center of the corridor, he counted six of these. Said, selecting a key from a bunch which he carried, opened one of the doors, held it ajar for Soames to enter, and permitted it to reclose behind him. Soames entered nervously. He found himself in a room identical in size with his own private apartment, a bathroom, etc., opened out of it in one corner after the same fashion. But their similarity ended. The bed in this apartment was constructed more on the lines of a modern steamer bunk, that is, it was surrounded by a rail, and was raised no more than a foot from the floor. The latter was covered with a rich carpet, worked in many colours, and the wall was hung with such paper as Soames had never seen hitherto in his life. The scheme of this mural decoration was distinctly Chinese, and consisted in an intricate design of human and animal figures, bewilderingly mingled. Its colouring was brilliant, and the scheme extended, unbroken, over the entire ceiling. Cushions, most fancifully embroidered, were strewn about the floor and the bed coverlet was a piece of heavy Chinese tapestry. A lamp, shaded with silk of a dull purple, swung in the center of the apartment, and an ebony table, inlaid with ivory, stood on one side of the bed. On the other was a cushioned armchair figured with the eternal chaotic Chinese design, and being littered at the moment with the garments of the man in the bed. The air of the room was disgusting, unbreathable. It caught Soames by the throat and sickened him. It was laden with some kind of fumes entirely unfamiliar to his nostrils. A dainty Chinese tea service stood upon the ebony table. For fully thirty seconds Soames, with his back to the door, gazed at the man in the bed and fought down the nausea which the air of the place had induced in him. This sleeper was a man of middle age, thin to emaciation and having lank, dark hair. His face was ghastly white, and he lay with his head thrown back, and with his arms hanging out upon either side of the bunk, so that his listless hands rested upon the carpet. It was a tragic face, a high intellectual brow and finely chiseled features, but it presented an indescribable aspect of decay. It was as the face of some classic statue which has long lain buried in humid ruins. Soames shook himself into activity and ventured to approach the bed. He moistened his dry lips and spoke. "'Good morning,' Sir, the words sounded wildly, fantastically out of place. Shall I prepare your bath? The sleeper showed no signs of awakening. Soames forced himself to touch one of the thrown back shoulders. He shook it gently. The man on the bed raised his arms and dropped them back again into their original position without opening his eyes. They are hiding, he murmured thickly. In tea thought Orange Grove, if the Falucca sails to closer, they will. Soames, finding something very horrifying in the broken words, shook the sleeper more urgently. "'Wake up, sir!' he cried. "'I'm going to prepare your bath. Don't let them.' "'Escape,' murmured the man, 
slowly opening his ears. Have not he struggled upright, glaring madly at the intruder? His light grey eyes had a glassiness as of long sickness, and his pupils, which were unnaturally dilated, began rapidly to contract, became almost invisible. Then they expanded again, and again contracted. Who the deuce are you? he murmured, passing his hand across his unshaven face. My name is Lucas, sir, said Soames, conscious that if he remained much longer in the place, he should be physically sick. At your service, shall I prepare the bath? The bath, said the man, sitting up more straightly, certainly, yes, of course. He looked at Soames, with a light of growing sanity creeping into his eyes. A faint flush tinged the pallid face, and his loose mouth twitched sensitively. Then said, he began, looking Soames up and down, Let me see, whom did you say you were? Lucas, sir, at your service. Ah, muttered the man, lowering his eyes in unmistakable shame. Yes, yes, of course. You are new here. Yes, sir. Shall I prepare your bath? Yes, please. This is Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, sir, yes. Of course it is Wednesday. You said your name was? Lucas, sir, reiterated Soames, and crossing the fantastic apartment, he entered the bathroom beyond. This contained the most modern appointments, and was on an altogether more luxurious scale than that attached to his own quarters. He noted, without drawing any deduction from the circumstance, that the fittings were of American manufacture. Here, as in the outer room, there was no window. An electric light hung from the center of the ceiling. Soames busied himself in filling the bath and laying out the towels upon the rack. "'Fairly warm, sir?' he asked. "'Not too warm, thank you.' replied the other, now stumbling out of bed and falling into the armchair, not too warm. If you will take your bath, sir, said Soames, returning to the outer room, I will brush your clothes and be ready to shave you. Yes, yes, said the man, rubbing his hands over his face wearily. You are new here? Soames, who was becoming used to answering this question, answered it once more without irritation. Yes, sir, will you take your bath now? It is nearly full, I think. The man stood up unsteadily and passed into the bathroom, closing the door behind him. Soames, seeking to forget his surroundings, took out from a small handbag which he found beneath the bed a razor case and a shaving stick, the clothes brush he had discovered in the bathroom, and now he set to work to brush the creased garments stacked in the armchair. He noted that they were of excellent make and that the linen was of the highest quality, he was thus employed when the outer door silently opened, and the face of said looked in. Gasm, said the Oriental, and he placed inside upon the carpet a pair of highly polished boots. The door was reclosed. Soames had all the garments in readiness by the time that the man emerged from the bathroom, looking slightly less ill and not quite so pallid. He wore a yellow silk kimono, and with greater composure than he had yet revealed, he seated himself in the armchair, that Soames might shave him. This operation Soames accomplished, and the subject, having partially dressed, returned to the bathroom to brush his hair. When his toilet was practically completed, "'Shall I pack the rest of the things in the bag, sir?' asked Soames. The man nodded affirmatively. Five minutes later he was ready to depart, and stood before the ex-butler a well-dressed, intellectual, but very debauched-looking gentleman. Being evidently well acquainted with the regime of the establishment, he pressed an electric bell beside the door, presented Soames with half a sovereign, and, as said reappeared, took his departure, leaving Soames more reconciled to his lot than he could ever have supposed possible. The task of cleaning the room was now commenced by Soames. Said returned, bringing him the necessary utensils, and for fifteen minutes or so he busied himself between the outer apartment and the bathroom. During this time he found leisure to study the extraordinary mural decorations, and, as he looked at them, he learned that they possessed a singular property. If one gazed continuously at any portion of the wall, the intertwined figures thereon took shape nay, took life. The intricate, elaborate design ceased to be a design and became a procession. A Saturnalia became a sinister comedy 
which when first visualized, shocked Soames immoderately. The horrors presented by these devices of evil cunning, crowding the walls, appalled the narrow mind of the beholder, revolted him in an even greater degree than they must have revolted a man of broader and cleaner mind. He became conscious of a quality of evil which pervaded the room. The entire place seemed to lie beneath a spell, beneath the spell of an invisible, immeasurably wicked intelligence. His reflections began to terrify him, and he hastened to complete his duties. The stench of the place was sickening him anew, and when at last said opened the door, Soames came out as a man escaping from some imminent harm. Die, muttered said. He pointed to the open door of a second room, identical in every respect with the first, and Soames started back with a smothered groan. Had his education been classical, he might have likened himself to Hercules laboring for Orgius, but his mind tending scripturally, he wondered if he had sold his soul to Satan in the person of the invisible Mr. King. Chapter 17 Can Sir Concessions Soames' character was of a pliable sort, and ere many days had passed he had grown accustomed to this unnatural existence among the living corpses in the catacombs of Hopin. He rarely saw Hopin, and desired not to see him at all. As for Mr. King, he even endeavoured to banish from his memory the name of that shadowy being. The memory of the Eurasian he could not banish, and was ever listening for the silvery voice, but in vain. He had no particular duties, apart from the care of the six rooms known as Block A, and situated in the corridor to the left of the cave of the Golden Dragon, this and the valeting of departing occupants. But the hours at which he was called upon to perform these duties varied very greatly. Sometimes he would attend to four human wrecks in the same morning, whilst perhaps on the following day he would not be called upon to officiate until late in the evening. One fact early became evident to him. There was a ceaseless stream of these living dead men pouring into the catacombs of Hope Inn, coming he knew not whence, and issuing forth again he knew not whither. Twice in the first week of his new and strange service he recognized the occupants of the rooms as men whom he had seen in the upper world. On entering the room of one of these, at ten o'clock at night, he almost cried out in his surprise for the limp. Sallow-faced creature extended upon the bed before him was none other than Sir Brian Malpas, the brilliant politician whom his leaders had earmarked for office in the next cabinet. As Soames stood contemplating him stretched there in his stupor, he found it hard to credit the fact that this was the same man whom political rivals feared for his hard brilliance, whom society courted, and whose engagement to the daughter of a peer had been announced only a few months before. Throughout this time, Soames had made no attempt to seek the light of day. He had not seen a newspaper. He knew nothing of the hue and cry raised throughout England, of the hunt for the murderer of Mrs. Vernon. He suffered principally from lack of companionship. The only human being with whom he ever came in contact was said, the Egyptian, and said at best was uncommunicative. A man of very limited intellect, Luke Soames had been at a loss for many days to reconcile Block A and its temporary occupants with any comprehensible scheme of things. Whereas some of the rooms would be laden with nauseating fumes, others would be free of these. The occupants, again, exhibited various symptoms. That he was a servant of an opium. Dender looks did not for some time become apparent to him. Then when first the theory presented itself, he was staggered by a discovery so momentous but it satisfied his mind only partially. Some men whom he valeted might have been doped with opium, certainly, but all did not exhibit those indications which, from hearsay, he associated with the resin of the white poppy. Knowing nothing of the numerous and exotic vices which have sprung from the soil of the Orient, he was at a loss for a full explanation of the facts as he saw them. Finding himself unmolested and noting in the privacy of his own apartment how handsomely his tips were accumulating, Soames was rapidly becoming reconciled to his underground existence, more especially as it spelt safety to a man wanted by the police. His duties thus far had never taken him beyond the corridor known as Block A, what might lie on the other side of the cave of the Golden Dragon he knew not. He never saw any of the habitues arrive, or actually leave. He did not know whether the staff of the place consisted of himself, said, 
Hopin, the Eurasian girl, and the other, or if there were more servants of this unseen master. But never a day passed by that the clearance of at least one apartment did not fall to his lot, and never an occupant quitted those cells without placing a golden gratuity in the valet's palm. His appetite returned, and he slept soundly enough in his clean white bedroom, content to lose the upper world temporarily, and to become a dweller in the catacombs where tips were large and plentiful. His was the mind of a domestic animal, neither learning from the past nor questioning the future, but dwelling only in the well-fed present. No other type of European, however lowly, could have supported existence in such a place. Thus the days passed, and the nights passed, the one merged imperceptibly in the other. At the end of the first week, two sovereigns appeared upon the breakfast tray which said, brought to Soames' room. And, some little time later, said reappeared with his bottles and paraphernalia to renew the ex-butler's makeup. As he was leaving the room, Ahohina Ganapolis Effendi, he muttered, and went out as Mr. Giannapolis entered. At sight of the Greek, Soames realized, in one emotional moment, how really lonely he had been, and how in his inmost heart he longed for a sight of the sun, for a breath of unpolluted air, for a glimpse of grey. Homely London. All the old radiance had returned to Giannapolis. His eyes were crossed in an amiable smile. My dear Soames, he cried, greeting the really delighted man, how well your new complexion suits you. Sit down, Soames, sit down and let us talk. Soames placed a chair for Giannapolis and seated himself upon the bed, twirling his thumbs in the manner which was his when under the influence of excitement. Now, Soames, continued Giannapolis, I mean Lucas, my anticipations which I mentioned to you on the night of the accident. You remember? Yes, said Soames rapidly, yes. Well, they have been realized. Our establishment here continues to flourish as of yore, Nothing has come to light in the press calculated to prejudice us in the eyes of our patrons, and although your own name, Soames, Soames started and clutched at the bed cover, although your own name has been freely mentioned on all sides, it is not generally accepted that you perpetrated the deed. Soames discovered his hair to be bristling, his skin tingled with a nervous apprehension. That I, he began dryly, paused and swallowed, that I perpetrated. Has it been... It has been hinted at by one or two Fleet Street theorists. Yes, Soames. But the post-mortem examination of the victim revealed the fact that she was addicted to drugs. Opium? asked Soames eagerly. Giannapolis smiled. What an observant mind you have, Soames, he said. So you have perceived that these groves are sacred to Our Lady of the Poppies. Well, in part that is true. Here, under the auspices of Mr. Hopin, fretful society seeks the solace of the brass pipe. Yes, Soames, that is true. Have you ever tried opium? Never, declared Soames with emphasis. Never. Well, it is a delight in store for you. But the reason of our existence as an institution, Soames, is not far to seek. Once the joys of Chandu become perceptible to the neophyte, a great need is felt, a crying need. One may drink opium or inject morphine, these and other crude measures, may satisfy temporarily, but if one would enjoy the delights of that fairyland, of that enchanted realm which bountiful nature has concealed in the heart of the poppy, one must retire from the ken of goths and vandals who do not appreciate such exquisite delights. One must dedicate not an hour snatched from grasping society, but successive days and nights to the goddess. Soames, barely understanding this discourse, listened eagerly to every word of it, whilst Giannapolis, waxing eloquent upon his strange thesis, seemed to be addressing, not his solitary auditor, but an invisible concourse. In common with the lesser deities, he continued, Our Lady of the Poppies is exacting, after a protracted sojourn at her shrine, so keen are the delights which she opens up to her worshippers that a period of lassitude, of exhaustion, inevitably ensues. This precludes the proper worship of the goddess in the home, and necessitates, I say necessitates the presence, in such a capital as London, of a suitable temple. You have the honour, Soames, 
to be a minor priest of that temple, Soames brushed his dyed hair with his fingers and endeavoured to look intelligent. A branch establishment, merely a sacred caravanserai where votaries might repose ere re-entering the ruder world, continued. Giannapolis has unfortunately been raided by the police. With that word, police, he seemed to come to earth again. Our arrangements, I am happy to say, were such that not one of the staff was found on the premises and no visible link existed between that establishment and this. But now, let us talk about yourself. You may safely take an evening off, I think. He scrutinized Soames attentively. You will be discreet as a matter of course, and I should not recommend your visiting any of your former haunts. I make this proposal, of course, with the full sanction of Mr. King. The muscles of Soames's jaw tightened at sound of the name, and he avoided the gaze of the crossed eyes. And the real purpose of my visit here this morning is to acquaint you with the little contrivance by which we ensure our privacy here. Once you are acquainted with it, you can take the air every evening at suitable hours on application to Mr. Hopin. Soames coughed dryly. Very good, he said in a strained voice. I am glad of that. I knew you would be glad, Soames, declared the smiling Giannapolis. And now, if you will step this way, I will show you the door by which you must come and go. He stood up, then bent confidentially to Soames's ear. Mr. King, very wisely, he whispered, has retained you on the premises hitherto because some doubt, some little doubt, remained respecting the information which had come into the possession of the police. Again that ominous word. But ere Soames had time to reflect, Giannapolis led the way out of the room and along the matting-lined corridor into the apartment of the Golden Dragon. Soames observed with a nervous tremor that Mr. Hopin sat upon one of the lounges, smoking a cigarette and arrayed in his usual faultless manner. He did not attempt to rise, however, as the pair entered, but merely nodded to Giannapolis and smiled mirthlessly at Soames. They quitted the room by the door opening on the stone steps, the door by which Soames had first entered into that evil Aladdin's cave. Giannapolis went ahead, and Soames, following him, presently emerged through a low doorway into a concrete paved apartment, having walls of Portland stone and a whitewashed ceiling. One end consisted solely of a folding gate, evidently designed to admit the limousine. Giannapolis turned as Soames stepped up beside him. If you will glance back, he said, you will see exactly where the door is situated. Soames did as directed and suppressed a cry of surprise. Four of the stone blocks were fictitious, were in verity a heavy wooden door faced in some way with real or imitation granite, a door communicating with the steps of the catacombs. Observe, said Giannapolis. He closed the door, which opened outward, and there remained nothing to show the keenest observer unless he had resorted to sounding that these four blocks differed in any way from their fellows. Ingenious, is it not? said Giannapolis genially. And now, my dear Soames, observe again. He rolled back the folding gates, and beyond was a garage, wherein stood the big limousine. I keep my car here, Soames, for the sake of convenience. And now, my dear Soames, when you go out this evening, said we'll close this entrance after you. When you return, which I understand you must do at ten o'clock, you will enter the garage by the side door yonder, which will not be locked, and you will press the electric button at the back of the petrol cans here. Look, you can see it. The inner door will then be opened for you. Step this way. He passed between the car and the wall of the garage, opened the door at the left of the entrance gates, and Soames following, came out into a narrow lane. For the first time in many days, Soames scented the cleaner air of the upper world, and with it, he filled his lungs gratefully. Behind him was the garage, before him the high wall of a yard, and, on his right for a considerable distance, extended a similar wall, in the latter case evidently that of a wharf or beyond it flowed the Thames. Proceeding along beside this wall, the two came to the gates of a warehouse. They passed these, however, and entered a small office. Crossing the office, they gained the interior of the warehouse, where chests bearing Chinese labels were stacked in great profusion. Then this place, began Soames, is a ginger warehouse, Soames. 
there is a very small office staff but sufficiently large to cope with the limited business done in the import and export of ginger. The firm is known as Kansu Concessions and imports preserved Chinese ginger from its own plantations in that province of the Celestial Empire. There is a small wharf attached, as you may have noted. Oh, it is a going concern and perfectly respectable. Soames looked about him with wide-opened eyes. The ginger staff, said Giannapolis, is not yet arrived. Mr. Ho Pin is the manager. The lane in which the establishment is situated communicates with Limehouse Causeway and being a cul-de-sac is little frequented. Only this one firm has premises actually opening into it, and I have converted the small corner building at the extremity of the wharf into a garage for my car. There are no means of communication between the premises of Kansor Concessions and those of the more important enterprise below, and I, myself, am not officially associated with the ginger trade. It is a precaution which we all adopt, however, never to enter or leave the garage if anyone is in sight. Soames became conscious of a new security. He set about his duties that morning with a greater alacrity than usual, valeting one of the living dead men, a promising young painter whom he chanced to know by sight, with a return to the old affable manner which had rendered him so popular during his career as cabin steward. He felt that he was now part and parcel of Kansu Concessions, that Kansu Concessions and he were at one. He had yet to learn that his sense of security was premature, and that his added knowledge might be an added danger. When Said brought his lunch into his room, he delivered also a slip of paper bearing the brief message, Go out 6.30 return 10. Mr. Soames uncorked his daily bottle of bass almost gaily, and attacked his lunch with avidity. Chapter 18 The World Above The night had set in greyly, and a drizzle of fine rain was falling. West India Dock Road presented a prospect so uninviting that it must have damped the spirits of anyone but a cave-dweller. Soames, buttoned up in a raincoat kindly lent by Mr. Giannapolis, and of a somewhat refined fit, with a little lagoon of rainwater forming within the reef of his hat brim, trudged briskly along. The necessary ingredients for the manufacture of mud are always present, if invisible during dry weather, in the streets of East End London, and already Soames' neat black boots were liberally bedaubed with it. But what cared Soames? He inhaled the soot-laden air rapturously, he was glad to feel the rain beating upon his face and took a childish pleasure in ducking his head suddenly and seeing the little stream of water spouting from his hat brim. How healthy they looked, these East End workers, these Italian dock hands, these Jewish tailors, these nondescript greasy beings who sometimes saw the sun. Many of them, he knew well, labored in cellars. But he had learnt that there are cellars and cellars. Ah, it was glorious, this grey, murky London. Yet, now that temporarily he was free of it, he realized that there was that within him which responded to the call of the catacombs. There was a fascination in the fume-laden air of those underground passages. There was a charm, a mysterious charm, in the cave of the Golden Dragon, in that unforgettable place which he assumed to mark the center of the labyrinth, in the wicked, black eyes of the Eurasian. He realized that between the abstraction of silver spoons and deliberate, organized money-making at the expense of society, a great chasm yawned, that there may be romance even in felony. Soames at last felt himself to be a traveler on the high road to fortune. He had become almost reconciled to the loss of his bank balance, to the loss of his place in the upper world. His was the constitution of a born criminal, and, had he been capable of subtle self-analysis, he must have known now that fear, and fear only, hitherto had held him back, had confined him to the ranks of the amateurs. Well, the plunge was taken. Deep in such reflections, he trudged along through the rain, scarce noting where his steps were leading him, for all roads were alike to night. His natural inclinations presently dictated a halt at a brilliantly lighted public house, and taking off his hat to shake some of the moisture from it, he replaced it on his head and entered the saloon lounge. The place proved to be fairly crowded, principally with local tradesmen whose forefathers had toiled for Pharaoh, and conveying his glass of whiskey to a marble-topped table in a corner, comparatively secluded, 
Soam sat down for a consideration of past, present, and future. An unusual mental exercise. Curiously enough, he had lost something of his old furtiveness. He no longer examined, suspiciously, every stranger who approached his neighborhood. For as the worshippers of old came by the gate of fear into the invisible presence of Moloch, so he of equally untutored mind had entered the presence of Mr. King, and no devotee of the Ammonite god had had greater faith in his potent protection than Soames had in that of his unseen master. What should a servant of Mr. King fear from the officers of the law? How puny a thing was the law in comparison with the director of that secret, powerful, invulnerable organization whereof today he, Soames, formed an unit? Then, oddly, the old dormant cowardice of the man received a sudden spurring and leaped into quickness. An evening paper lay upon the marble top of the table, and carelessly taking it up, Soames, hitherto lost in imaginings, was now reminded that for more than a week he had lain in ignorance of the world's doings. Good heavens, how forgetful he had been. It was the Nepenthe of the catacombs. He must make up for lost time and get in touch again with passing events. Especially he must post himself up on the subject of the murder. The paper dropped from his hands and, feeling himself blanch beneath his artificial tan, Soames, in his old furtive manner, glanced around the saloon to learn if he were watched. Apparently no one was taking the slightest notice of him, and with an unsteady hand he raised his glass and drained its contents. There, at the bottom of the page before him, was the cause of this sudden panic, a short paragraph conceived as follows. Reported Arrest of Soames it is reported that a man answering to the description of Soames, the butler wanted in connection with the Palace Mansion's outrage, has been arrested in Birmingham. He was found sleeping in an outhouse belonging to Major Jennings, of Alton, and as he refused to give any account of himself, was handed over by the gentleman's gardener to the local police. His resemblance to the published photograph being observed, he was closely questioned, and although he denies being Luke Soames, he is being held for further inquiry. Soames laid down the paper, and walking across to the bar, ordered a second glass of whiskey. With this he returned to the table and began more calmly to reread the paragraph. From it he passed to the other news. He noted that little publicity was given to the Palace Mansions affair, from which he judged that public interest in the matter was already growing cold. A short summary appeared on the front page, and this he eagerly devoured. It read as follows, Palace Mansion's mystery the police are following up an important clue to the murder of Mrs. Vernon, and it is significant in this connection that a man answering to the description of Soames was apprehended at Alton, Birmingham late last night. See page 6. The police are very reticent in regard to the new information which they hold, but it is evident that at last they are confident of establishing a case. Mr. Henry LaRue, the famous novelist, in whose flat the mysterious outrage took place, is suffering from a nervous breakdown, but is reported to be progressing favorably by Dr. Cumberley, who is attending him. Dr. Cumberley, it will be remembered, was with Mr. LaRue and Mr. John Exel, MP, at the time that the murder was discovered. The executors of the late Mr. Horace Vernon are faced with extraordinary difficulties in administering the will of the deceased. Owing to the tragic coincidence of his wife's murder within 24 hours of his own demise, public curiosity respecting the nursing home in Gillingham Street, with its electric baths and other modern appliances, has by no means diminished, and groups of curious spectators regularly gather outside the former establishment of Nurse Proctor, and apparently derive some form of entertainment from staring at the windows and questioning the constable on duty. The fact that Mrs. Vernon undoubtedly came from this establishment on the night of the crime, and that the proprietors of the nursing home fled immediately, leaving absolutely no clue behind them, complicates the mystery which Scotland Yard is engaged in unravelling. It is generally believed that the woman, Proctor, and her associates had actually no connection with the crime, and that realising that the inquiry might turn in their direction, they decamped. The obvious inference, of course, is that the nursing home was conducted on lines which would not bear official scrutiny. The flight of the butler, Soames, presents a totally different aspect, and in this direction the police are very active. 
Soames searched the remainder of the paper scrupulously but failed to find any further reference to the case. The second Scottish stimulant had served somewhat to restore his failing courage. He congratulated himself upon taking the only move which could have saved him from arrest. He perceived that he owed his immunity entirely to the protective wings of Mr. King. He trembled to think that his fate might indeed have been that of the man arrested at Alton, for without money and without friends he would have become, ere this, just such an outcast and natural object of suspicion. He noted as a curious circumstance that throughout the report there was no reference to the absence of Mrs. LaRue, therefore a primitive reasoner. He assumed that she was back again at Palace Mansions. He was mentally incapable of fitting Mrs. LaRue into the secret machine engineered by Mr. King through the visible agency of Hope Inn. On the whole, he was disposed to believe that her several absences, ostensibly on visits to Paris, had nothing to do with the catacombs of Hope Inn, but were to be traced to the amours of the radiant Giannapolis. Taking into consideration his reception by the Chinaman in the cave of the Golden Dragon, he determined, to his own satisfaction, that this had been dictated by prudence and by Mr. Giannapolis. In short, he believed that the untimely murder of Mrs. Vernon had threatened to direct attention to the commercial enterprise of the Greek, and that he, Soames, had become incorporated in the latter in this accidental fashion. He believed himself to have been employed in a private intrigue during the time that he was at Palace Mansions and counted it a freak of fate that Mr. Giannapolis's affairs of the pocket had intruded upon his affairs of the heart. It was all very confusing, and entirely beyond Soames's mental capacity to unravel. He treated himself to a third Scotch whisky, and sallied out into the rain. A brilliantly lighted music hall upon the opposite side of the road attracted his attention. The novelty of freedom having worn off, he felt no disposition to spend the remainder of the evening in the street. For the rain was now falling heavily, but determined to sample the remainder of the program offered by the first house, and presently was reclining in a plush-covered tip-up seat in the back row of the stalls. The program was not of sufficient interest wholly to distract his mind, and during the performance of a very tragic comedian, Soames found his thoughts wandering far from the stage. His seat was at the extreme end of the back row, and quite unintentionally he began to listen to the conversation of two men, who standing just inside the entrance door and immediately behind him to the right, were talking in subdued voices. There are thousands of kings in London, said one. Soames slowly lowered his hands to the chair arms on either side of him and clutched them tightly. Every nerve in his body seemed to be strung up to the ultimate pitch of tensity. He was listening, now, as a man arraigned might listen for the pronouncement of a judgment. That's the trouble, replied a second voice. But you know Max's ideas on the subject? He has his own way of going to work. But my idea, Sowerby, is that if we can find the one Mr. Soames, and I am open to bet he hasn't left London, we shall find the right Mr. King. The comedian finished, and the orchestra noisily corded him off. Soames, his forehead wet with perspiration, began to turn his head inch by inch. The lights in the auditorium were partially lowered, and he prayed, devoutly, that they would remain so, for now, glancing out of the corner of his right eye, he saw the speakers. The taller of the two, a man wearing a glistening brown overall and rain-drenched tweed cap, was the detective who had been in LaRue's study and who had ordered him to his room on the night of the murder. Then commenced for Soames such an ordeal as all his previous life had not offered him, an ordeal beside which even the interview with Mr. King sank into insignificance. His one hope was in the cunning of said's disguise, but he knew that Scotland Yard men judged likenesses, not by complexions, which are alterable, not by the colour of the hair which can be dyed but by certain features which are measurable and which may be memorized because nature has fashioned them immutable. What should he do? What should he do? In the silence, no good stopping any longer, came the whispered voice of the shorter detective. I have had a good look around the house and there is nobody here. Soames literally held his breath. We'll get along down to the dock gate, was the almost inaudible reply. 
I'm meeting Stringer there at nine o'clock. Walking softly, the Scotland Yard men passed out of the theatre. Chapter 19. The Living Dead. The night held yet another adventure in store for Soames. His encounter with the two Scotland Yard men had finally expelled all thoughts of pleasure from his mind. The upper world, the free world, was beset with pitfalls. He realized that for the present, at any rate, there could be no security for him save in the catacombs of Hope Inn. He came out of the music hall and stood for a moment just outside the foyer, glancing fearfully up and down the rain-swept street. Then, resuming the drenched raincoat which he had taken off in the theatre and turning up its collar about his ears, he set out to return to the garage adjoining the warehouse of Cannes Sur Concessions. He had fully another hour of leave if he cared to avail himself of it, but, whilst every pedestrian assumed, in his eyes, the form of a detective, whilst every dark corner seemed to conceal an ambush, whilst every passing instant he anticipated feeling a heavy hand upon his shoulder and almost heard the words, Luke Soames, I arrest you. Whilst this was his case, freedom had no joys for him. No light guided him to the garage door, and he was forced to seek for the handle by groping along the wall. Presently, his hand came in contact with it. He turned it, and the way was open before him. Being far from familiar with the geography of the place, he took out a box of matches and struck one to light him to the shelf above which the bell push was concealed. Its feeble light revealed not only the big limousine near which he was standing and the usual fixtures of a garage, but dimly penetrating beyond into the black places, it also revealed something else. The door in the false granite blocks was open. Soames, who had advanced to seek the bell push, stopped short. The match burnt down almost to his fingers, whereupon he blew it out and carefully crushed it under his foot. A faint reflected light rendered perceptible the stone steps below. At the top, Soames stood looking down. Nothing stirred above, below, or around him. What did it mean? Dimly to his ears came the hooting of some siren from the river, evidently that of a large vessel. Still he hesitated. Why he did so, he scarce knew, save that he was afraid, vaguely afraid. Then he asked himself what he had to fear, and conjuring up a mental picture of his white bedroom below. He planted his foot firmly upon the first step, and from thence descended to the bottom, guided by the faint light which shone out from the doorway beneath. But the door proved to be only partly opened, and Soames knocked deferentially. No response came to his knocking, and he so greatly ventured as to push the door fully open. The cave of the Golden Dragon was empty. Half frightfully, Soames glanced about the singular apartment in amid the mountainous cushions of the Lewins. Behind the pedestal of the dragon, to the right and to the left of the doorway wherein he stood, there was no one there but the door on the right, the door inlaid with ebony and green stone, which he had never yet seen open was open now, widely opened. He glided across the floor, his wet boots creaking unmusically, and peeped through, he saw a matting-lined corridor, identical with that known as Block A. The door of one apartment, that on the extreme left, was opened. Sickly fumes were wafted out to him, and these mingled with the incense-like odor which characterized the Temple of the Dragon. A moment he stood so, then started back, appalled. An outcry, the outcry of a woman, of a woman whose very soul is assailed, split the stillness. Not from the passageway before him, but from somewhere behind him, from the direction of Blocker, it came. For God's sake, oh, for God's sake, have mercy, let me go, let me go. Higher, shriller, more fearful and urgent grew the voice, let me go. Soames's knees began to tremble beneath him. He clutched at the black wall for support, then turned, and with unsteady footsteps crossed to the door, communicating with the corridor which contained his room. It had a lever handle of the continental pattern, and trembling with apprehension that it might prove to be locked, Soames pressed down this handle. The door opened. Hina, Ifendi, Ina, the voice sounded like that of said. Oh, God in heaven, help me. Help, help. Imsik. Footsteps were pattering upon the stone stairs. 
Someone was descending from the warehouse. The frenzied shrieks of the woman continued. Soames broke into a cold perspiration. His heart, which had leaped wildly, seemed now to have changed to a cold stone in his breast. Just at the entrance to the corridor he stood, frozen with horror at those cries. Ik feel el bab, came now in the voice of Hopin, and nearer. Let me go. Only let me go, and I will never breathe a word. Ah, ah, oh, God of mercy, not the needle again. You are killing me, not the needle. Soames staggered on to his own room and literally fell within, as across the cave of the golden dragon behind him, someone, one whom he did not see but only heard, one whom with all his soul he hoped had not seen him passed rapidly. Another shriek, more frightful than any which had preceded it, struck the trembling man as an arrow might have struck him. He dropped upon his knees at the side of the bed and thrust his fingers firmly into his ears. He had never swooned in his life and was unfamiliar with the symptoms. But now he experienced a sensation of overpowering nausea. A blood-red mist floated before his eyes, and the floor seemed to rock beneath him like the deck of a ship. That soul-appalling outcry died away, merged into a sobbing, moaning sound which defied Soames' efforts to exclude it. He rose to his feet, feeling physically ill, and turned to close his door. They were dragging someone, someone who sighed, shudderingly, and whose sighs sank to moans, and sometimes rose to sobs across the apartment of the dragon. In a faint, dying voice, the woman spoke again, "'Not Mr. King, not Mr. King, is there no God in heaven? Ah, spare me!' Spare Soames closed the door and stood propped up against it, striving to fight down the deathly sickness which assailed him, his clothes were sticking to his clammy body, and a cold perspiration was trickling down his forehead and into his eyes. The sensation at his heart was unlike anything that he had ever known. He thought that he must be dying. The awful sounds died away. Then a muffled disturbance drew his attention to a sort of square trap which existed high up on one wall of the room, but which admitted no light, and which hitherto had never admitted any sound. Now, in the utter darkness, he found himself listening, listening. He had learnt during his duties in Block A that each of the minute suites was rendered soundproof in some way, so that what took place in one would be inaudible to the occupant of the next, provided that both doors were closed. He perceived now that some precaution hitherto exercised continuously had been omitted tonight, and that the sounds which he could hear came from the room next to his own, the room which opened upon the corridor that he had never entered, and which now he classified, mentally, as Block B. What did it mean? Obviously there had been some mishap in the usually smooth conduct of Hopin's catacombs. There had been a hurried outgoing in several directions. A search? And by the accident of his returning an hour earlier than he was expected, he was become a witness of this incident, or of its dreadful concluding phases. He had begun to move away from the door, but now he returned and stood leaning against it, that stifling room where roses shed their petals. Had been opened tonight, a chill touched the very center of his being and told him so. The occupant of that room, the minotaur of this hideous labyrinth was at large tonight, was roaming the passages about him, was perhaps outside his very door. Dull moaning sounds reached him through the trap. He realized that if he had the courage to cross the room, stand upon a chair and place his ear to the wall, he might be able to detect more of what was passing in the next apartment. But craven fear held him in its grip, and in vain he strove to shake it off, Trembling wildly, he stood with his back to the door, whilst muttered words and moans, ever growing fainter, reached him from beyond. A voice, a harsh, guttural voice, surely not that of Hopin was audible, above the moaning. For two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. He stood there, tottering on the brink of insensibility. Then, a faint sound, a new sound, drew his gaze across the room, and up to the corner where the trap was situated. A very dim light was dawning there. He could just detect the outline of an opening a half-light, 
breaking the otherwise impenetrable darkness. He felt that his capacity for fear was strained to its utmost, that he could support nothing more, yet a new horror was in store for him. For, as he watched that grey patch, in it, as in a frame, a black silhouette appeared, the silhouette of a human head. A woman's head. Soames convulsively clenched his jaws, for his teeth were beginning to chatter. A whistle, an eerie minor whistle, subscribed the ultimate touch of terror to the night. The silhouette disappeared, and shortly afterwards the grey luminance. A faint click told of some shutter being fastened. Complete silence reigned. Soames groped his way to the bed and fell weakly upon it, half lying down and burying his face in the pillow. For how long, he had no idea, but for some considerable time he remained so, fighting to regain sufficient self-possession to lie to Hope in, who sooner or later must learn of his return. At last he managed to sit up. He was not trembling quite so wildly, but he still suffered from a deathly sickness. A faint streak of light from the corridor outside shone under his door. As he noted it, it was joined by a second streak, forming a triangle. There was a very soft rasping of metal. Someone was opening the door. Soames lay back upon the bed. This time he was past further panic and come to a stage of sickly apathy. He lay now because he could not sit upright, because stark horror had robbed him of physical strength and had drained the well of his emotions dry. Gradually so that the operation seemed to occupy an interminable time, the door opened, and in the opening a figure appeared. The switch clicked, and the room was flooded with electric light. Hopin stood watching him, Soames in his eyes that indescribable expression seen in the eyes of a bird placed in a cobra's den met the Chinaman's gaze. This gaze was no different from that which habitually he directed upon the people of the catacombs. His yellow face was set in the same mirthless smile, and his eyebrows were raised interrogatively. For the space of ten seconds he stood watching the man on the bed. Then, you return very soon, Mr. Soames, he said softly. Soames groaned like a dying man, whispering, I was, taken ill very aisle. So you return before the time arranged for you. His metallic voice was sunk in a soothing hiss. He smiled steadily, he betrayed no emotion. Yes, sir, whispered Soames, his hair clamorly adhering to his brow and beads of perspiration trickling slowly down his nose. And when you return, you see and you hear strange things, Mr. Soames. Soames, who was in imminent danger of becoming physically ill, gulped noisily. No, sir, he whispered tremulously. I've been in here all the time. Hopin nodded, slowly and sympathetically, but never removed the glittering eyes from the face of the man on the bed. So you hear nothing and see nothing? The words were spoken even more softly than he had spoken hitherto. Nothing, protested Soames. He suddenly began to tremble anew, and his trembling rattled the bed. I have been very ill indeed, sir. Hopin nodded again slowly and with deep sympathy. Some medicine shall be sent to you, Mr. Soames, he said. He turned and went out slowly, closing the door behind him. Chapter 20 Abraham Levinsky Butts In at about the time that this conversation was taking place in Hope Inn's catacombs, Detective Inspector Dunbar and Detective Sergeant Sowerby were joined by a third representative of New Scotland Yard at the appointed spot by the Dock Gates. This was Stringer, the detective to whom was assigned the tracing of the missing Soames, and he loomed up through the rain mist, a glistening but dejected figure. Any luck? inquired Sowerby sepulchrally. Stringer, a dark and morose-looking man, shook his head. I've beaten up every person in Wapping and Limehouse, I should reckon, he said plaintively. They're all as innocent as babes unborn. You can take it from me, Chinatown hasn't got a murder on its conscience at present. Brr, it's a beastly night. Suppose we have one. Dunbar nodded, and the three wet investigators walked back for some little distance in silence, presently emerging via a narrow, dark, uninviting alleyway into West India Dock Road. A brilliantly lighted hostelry proved to be their objective, and there, in a quiet corner of the deserted billiard room, over their glasses, 
they discussed this mysterious case, which at first had looked so simple of solution if only because it offered so many unusual features, but which, the deeper they probed, merely revealed fresh complications. The business of those fry people in Scotland was a rotten disappointment, said Dunbar suddenly. They were merely paid by the late Mrs. Vernon to readdress letters to a little newspaper shop in Knightsbridge where an untraceable boy used to call for them. Martin has just reported this evening. Perth wires for instructions, but it's a dead end, I'm afraid. You know, said Sarby, fishing a piece of cork from the brown froth of a fine example by Guinness. To my mind are hopes in Soames, and if we want to find Soames, to my mind we want to look not east but west. Here, here, concorded Stringer, gloomily sipping hot rum. It seems to me, continued Sowerby, that Limehouse is about the last place in the world a man like Soames would think of hiding in. It isn't where he'll be thinking of hiding, snapped Dunbar, turning his fierce eyes upon the last speaker. You can't seem to get the idea out of your head, Sowerby, that Soames is an independent agent. He isn't an independent agent. He's only the servant, and through the servant we hope to find the master. But why in the East End? came the plaintive voice of Stringer. For only one reason, that I can see, because Max says that there's a Chinaman in the case. There's opium in the case, isn't there? said Dunbar, adding more water to his whiskey. And where there's opium there is pretty frequently a Chinaman. But to my mind, persisted Sowerby, his eyebrows drawn together in a frown of concentration, the place where Mrs. Vernon used to get the opium was the place we raided in Gillingham Street. Nurse Proctor's, cried Stringer, banging his fist on the table. Exactly my idea. There may have been a Chinaman concerned in the management of the Gillingham Street stunt, or there may not, but I'll swear that was where the opium was supplied. In fact, I don't think that there's any doubt about it. Medical evidence opinions differed a bit, certainly went to show that she had been addicted to opium for some years. Other evidence, you got it yourself, Inspector, went to show that she came from Gillingham Street on the night of the murder. Gillingham Street crowd vanished like a beautiful dream before we had time to nab them. What more do you want? What are we up to? Messing about in Limehouse and Wapping. Sowerby partook of a long drink and turned his eyes upon Dunbar, awaiting the inspector's reply. You both have the wrong idea, said Dunbar deliberately. You are all wrong. You seem to be under the impression that if we could lay our hands upon the missing staff of the so-called nursing home, we should find the assassin to be one of the crowd. It doesn't follow at all. For a long time, you Sowerby, he turned his tawny eyes upon the sergeant, had the idea that Soames was the murderer, and I'm not sure that you have got rid of it yet. You, Stringer, appear to think that Nurse Proctor is responsible. Upon my word, you are a hopeless pair. Suppose Soames had nothing whatever to do with the matter, but merely realised that he could not prove an alibi. Wouldn't you bolt? I put it to you. Sowerby stared hard, and Stringer scratched his chin reflectively. The same reasoning applies to the Gillingham Street people, continued Dunbar. We haven't the slightest idea of their whereabouts because we don't even know who they were. But we do know something about Soames, and we're looking for him not because we think he did the murder, but because we think he can tell us who did. Which brings us back to the old point, interrupted Stringer, softly beating his fist upon the table at every word. Why are we looking for Soames in the East End? Because, replied Dunbar, we're working on the theory that Soames, though actually not accessory to the crime, was in the pay of those who were. Well, Stringer spoke the word eagerly, his eyes upon the inspector's face. And those who were accessory, continued Dunbar, were servants of Mr. King. Ah! Stringer brought his fist down with a bang, Mr. King. That's where I am in the dark, and where Sowerby here is in the dark. He bent forward over the table. Who the devil is Mr. King? Dunbar twirled his whiskey glass between his fingers. We don't know, he replied quietly. But Soames does, in all probability and that's why we're looking for Soames. Is it why we're looking in Limehouse? persisted Stringer, the argumentative. It is, snapped Dunbar. We have only got one Chinatown worthy of the name in London. 
and that's not ten minutes' walk from here. Chinatown, yes, said Sowerby, his red face glistening with excitement. But why look for Mr. King in Chinatown? Because, replied Dunbar, lowering his voice, Mr. King in all probability is a Chinaman. Who says so? demanded Stringer. Max says so. Max! Again Stringer beat his fist upon the table. Now we have got to it. We're working, then, not on our own theories, but on those of Max. Dunbar's sallow face flushed slightly, and his eyes seemed to grow brighter. Mr. Gaston Max obtained information in Paris, he said, which he placed, unreservedly, at my disposal. We went into the matter thoroughly, with the result that our conclusions were identical. A certain Mr. King is at the bottom of this mystery, and, in all probability, Mr. King is a Chinaman. Do I make myself clear? Sarby and Stringer looked at one another perplexedly. Each man finished his drink in silence. Then, what took place in Paris, began Sowerby. There was an interruption. A stooping figure in a shabby black frock coat, the figure of a man who wore a dilapidated bowler pressed down upon his ears who had a greasy, Semitic countenance with a scrubby, curling, sandy-colored beard, sparse as the vegetation of a desert, appeared at Sowerby's elbow. He carried a brimming pewter pot, this he set down upon a corner of the table, depositing himself in a convenient chair, and pulling out a very dirty-looking letter from an inside pocket. He smoothed it carefully. He peered, little-eyed, from the frowning face of Dunbar to the surprised countenance of Sowerby, and smiled with native amiability at the dangerous-looking Stringer. "'Excuse me,' he said, and his propitiatory smile was expansive and dazzling. "'Excuse me, buttonin' like thith. It themeth rude, I know it doth theme rude, but the fact of the matter ith, I'm a tailor thaths my pithneth, a tailor. When I thay a tailor, I really mean a breecheth maker thath what I mean, a breecheth maker. Now these time thith very hard time for breecheth maketh. Dunbar finished his whiskey, and quietly replaced the glass upon the table, looking from Sowerby to Stringer with unmistakable significance. Stringer emptied his glass of rum, and Sowerby disposed of his stout. I got thith letter lath night, continued the breeches maker, bending forward confidentially over the table. The document looked at least twelve months old. I got thith letter lath night with e three fiveth in it, and not having no friendth in London, I'm an American thithithan by birth Levinsky. My name is Abraham Levinsky. I'm a New Englander. Well, not having no friendth in London, and thee and you three gentlemen sit in here, I took the liberty. Dunbar stood up, glared at Levinsky, and stalked out of the billiard room, followed by his equally indignant satellites. Having gained the outer door, of all the blasted impudence, he said, turning to Sowerby and Stringer, but there was a glint of merriment in the fierce eyes. Can you beat that? Did you tumble to his game? Sowerby stared at Stringer and Stringer stared at Sowerby. Except, began the latter, in a voice hushed with amazement, that he's got the coolest cheek of any mortal being I ever met. Dunbar's grim face relaxed, and he laughed boyishly, his square shoulders shaking. He was leading up to the confidence trick, he said between laughs. Damn it all, man, it was the old confidence trick, the idea of a confidence merchant spreading out his wares before three CID men. He was choking with laughter again. And now, Sowerby and Stringer having looked at one another for a moment, the surprised pair joined him in his merriment. They turned up their collars and went out into the rain, still laughing. That man, said Sowerby, as they walked across to the stopping place of the electric trains, is capable of calling on the commissioner and asking him to find the lady. Thank you for joining us for the first part of The Yellow Claw by Sax Roma, the plot has thickened, and the suspense is building as our heroes and villains are drawn deeper into a web of intrigue and danger. Don't miss the next part, where the story continues to unravel with more excitement and peril. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any updates. We appreciate your support, and look forward to bringing you the next thrilling installment.